Good afternooning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for being present uh, at this uh, event, which is the first uh, event marking the existence or the creation of the Observatory of the European Court uh, of Human Rights. I will come to that in a minute. I would like, first of all, uh, to salute uh, the participants uh, very warmly, uh, Judge President Robert Spano, President of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, thank you again for finding time in your busy schedule to be in this event and to uh, help us with uh, this uh, first event of the uh, observatory, which is of course a, uh, a, a marking moment uh, and of course, thanks to uh, all the other uh, participants, uh, Judge Anna Guerra Martins, my dear colleague and friend, uh, Mrs. Fatima Carvalho, uh, representing the Portuguese uh, state with the European Court of Human Rights, a uh, public prosecutor. We, we go back, well, not long, long, but uh, we have already some events uh, in uh, common, so it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, and we have uh, Mr. Francisco Teixeira da Mota, uh, a, a lawyer, which uh, of course does not need any kind of introduction, very known in Portugal for his litigation with the European Court of Human Rights, namely uh, in what comes to freedom of expression cases, but of course there are others, these are probably the most known. And uh, Judge uh, João da Silva Miguel uh, of the Supreme Court of Justice, who is presently the director of the Center for Judiciary Studies. Uh, for those who might not be aware of uh, what this uh, exactly means, it's the Portuguese School for Judges. Uh, so in a way we have representatives from, uh, from all the, 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 the angles of uh, from all the angles of the uh, around the European Court, let's say uh, we have uh, European Court judges, we have uh, lawyers, we have uh, domestic judges, and we also have the prosecution. So the representation of the uh, of the um, of the states um, with the European Court of Human Rights. This is. Uh, uh, this was the, the, the criterion that was present in the, of course, the invitations that we, uh, that we sent. We intended to have uh, an institutional uh, framework uh, for this uh, first event. So to all of you and uh, very particularly to uh, President Robert Spano, um, my uh, salutes, my thanks uh, in my name, of course, as a coordinator of the observatory, but also in the name of the faculty, because uh, our Dean, Professor Paula Vashfreire, was not able to be present here today, uh, but she uh, endorsed me the task to, uh, to extend our institutional, uh, our institutional uh, compliments to all participants, as well as the president of uh, the Legal Political Science in Institute, uh, also not being able to be present here today, Professor Maria Louise Edouard, we, who also sends everyone her best and thanks for uh, participating in this event. Uh, let me uh, say a few words uh, as I was, uh, uh, as I was, um, as I was saying, regarding uh, the uh, uh, regarding the event and uh, the the observatory, the observatory of the European Court of Human Rights was recently uh, created within uh, our institute, within our research institute, and the purpose of this project is to follow the European Court of Human Rights and its dynamics and place as an institution. And the analysis of the court's decisions is, of course, an indispensable aspect. 
but the observatory aims at a more comprehensive debate on the court's work and influence. Uh, and this was uh, um, actually what was uh, behind the, the choice of this first uh, topic for our first webinar, the role of the European Court of Human Rights today and tomorrow. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights was always very vigorous, pointing that it is not an instance of appeal vis-a-vis -vis the state's parties' domestic courts. Uh, this has long been considered uh, a way to stress the place of the European Convention on Human Rights and Freedoms as an instrument of international law, and also a cautious way to proceed by the European Court of Human Rights. In a certain perspective, the framework of the European Convention supports such an affirmation on the European Court's place, namely the obligation for states parties to ensure effective domestic remedies. But there are contradictory signs and not just coming from the court. If one places oneself at a certain distance, both the numbers and the contents of applications show that people claim for the European Court of Human Rights much more than uh, a traditional control of conventionality. And this claim is leveraged by the existence of a direct application mechanism, which nowadays is exercised even from outside Europe. From another perspective, the range of facts which are analyzed by the European Court of Human Rights, corresponding to manifestations of domestic powers of various natures, being legislative, judicial, or administrative, together with a wide range of types of decisions by the court itself, place it in a different position when compared to other supranational courts. In this sense, there are reasons for questioning today the court's role. Is it still an international court in the more traditional sense? Is it becoming a constitutional court, even if different from the domestic constitutional jurisdictions? And if so, in what way? Is it also an administrative court of law since it deals with the conduct of uh, administrative powers and so many times gives them a direction of conduct? And are there situations in which the European Court of Human Rights is closer than further uh, from an instance of appeal vis-a-vis -vis domestic courts of law? Well, this webinar intends to promote a debate on the court's role today, not to determine it at last, not, nor for, to provide definitive arguments in a specific uh, direction, but to contribute to open the way for uh, an unprejudiced discussion on the matter. This seems important uh, in order to refresh perspectives and instruments to dialogue with visions so different as principle of resistance to the court's decisions on the one hand, or the almost unbounded expression of the court's powers responding to popular demands on the other. The canvas for the debate is not merely the European Convention's text and the court's jurisprudence, but a broader one in which the European Court of Human Rights is a tip of the spear, so to speak, uh, of the complex system of the Council of Europe's legal order. Even more, uh, is Europe conceivable without the European Court of Human Rights? Would it be plausible to uh, look uh, to, to perspective relinquishing its jurisprudence to the archives of history Negative answers to these questions inevitably place both a burden and an institutional guarantee upon the European Court of Human Rights. And so debating the role of the court today is also inevitably debating its role for tomorrow. Uh, there are many topics to consider, like the constitutionalization of the European Convention on Human Rights, the judicial dialogue between the European Court and domestic courts and even the ECG, ECJ, sorry, uh, the extraterritorial effects of the European Convention on Human Rights, state's margin of appreciation, and so many other topics which are relevant and important for this, uh, uh, for this discussion. But this was just to uh, establish a 
canvas for our uh, presentations and discussion. Of course, the interventions are uh, totally free uh, in their topics. Uh, as with the European Court of Human Rights, we will we can have two official working languages, English and French. So uh, we can have interventions both in English and French. And of course, uh, questions can also use uh, both uh, languages. Uh, so uh, I will give the floor uh, immediately to President Robert Spano. Um, at the end of uh, President Spano's presentation, we will have a short uh, period uh, of um, uh, of questions because uh, uh, President Spano might have to leave in the meantime. Uh, but the rest of the questions and of the debate will be relinquished to the the end of our uh, the end of our presentations. We will have uh, by then a period of between twenty five to thirty minutes of debate and uh, five minutes at the end of. President Spano's uh, uh, presentation. So without any further delay and think, thanking you all again, I give the floor to President Robert Spano. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor. Um, I am very pleased to participate in this uh, webinar um, for the newly created observatory. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to be a part of uh, the process of creation or being a part of the debate that you are engendering within uh, this uh, research institution. I would very much like to thank uh, my dear colleague, uh, Judge Anna Mera Guerra Martins, who for being instrumental, of course, in organizing my participation in this important event. It has been a great honor and pleasure for the court to have uh, Judge Guerra Martins with us uh, for the time she has been at the court. The issue that we are discussing is a primordial one. Uh, it is one which has been discussed for decades. It is an issue which is discussed today, and it is an issue which will be discussed in the future. Because the European Court of Human Rights is an institution, an international institution, which is set within the framework of sovereign states, and therefore, uh, an interaction, a dialogue between the court and the national uh, judiciaries and authorities is, of course, extremely important for mutual awareness and an understanding of the court's role within the convention system. I would like to begin uh, by exploring the concept of subsidiarity uh, as, it, as it is understood in the convention system, and secondly, I will turn to the place of the court in that system and finally look at the extent to which the convention is, to use an English term, embedded, in, 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 conceptualized within the member states of the Council of Europe. So let me then turn to my first of these three parts. It is the member states, and I think this is a very important starting point in any understanding of the convention system. It is the member states who are first and foremost responsible for the effective implementation of the international human rights norms, which they have voluntarily signed up to by virtue of Article 1 of the European Convention on Human Rights. It is the states parties that undertake to secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms enshrined in the convention and note Article 1 talks about the states' parties. It does not talk about the European Court of Human Rights. The, 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 the organizational framework is one of human rights being created at ground level and rising up. That is why the member states, on the basis of the concept of shared responsibility, are the focal points. Now, this concept of shared responsibility has been strengthened during the so-called interlock and reform process, which began in 2010 and drew to a close in Athens last November, 10 years later. One of the overarching themes of this reform process was to increase the embeddedness of the convention at national level. In the 2012 Brighton Declaration, 
it was decided to add a recital to the preamble of the convention, affirming that the states parties in accordance with the principle of subsidiarity, which I am discussing now, have the primary responsibility to secure the rights and freedoms defined in the convention and the protocols, and that in doing so, they enjoy a margin of appreciation subject to the supervisory jurisdiction of the court itself. This recital will come into effect once protocol number 15 to the convention is ratified by the last remaining state to do so, which is Italy, which we hope will be actually in the next few weeks. Sovereign states, and I think this is an, an important doctrinal starting point, sovereign states are the main actors under public international law and the remaining actors, such as international organizations, derive their powers and legitimacy from them. It is for this reason that the court may not overstep the boundaries of the general powers delegated to it by the states of their sovereign will. Indeed, the court's jurisdiction is limited by Article 19 to ensuring that the contracting states observe their engagements under the convention. Now, in keeping with this logic, it is the states who should be the first to address human rights issues which arise on their territory. However, whilst at the same time retaining their full sovereignty, the member states of the Council of Europe have explicitly accepted by sovereign choice that their actions in the field of human rights can be reviewed critically by an international court, uh, the Strasbourg Court. Indeed, as the court has repeatedly held by reason of their direct and continuous contact with their vital forces of their countries, the domestic authorities are better placed than an international court to assess the multitude of factors surrounding each case. It is therefore primarily for the former to identify and afford redress for possible infringements of human rights in each particular case. However, Subsidiarity is not a concept which in any way limits the Strasbourg Court's competence to review substantive findings at national level at the stage of application of convention principles. The correct understanding of subsidiarity is one of give and take, of shared responsibility, of mutual understanding between the national authorities and the Strasbourg Court. Before finishing this first part of my intervention, I would like to make the following point. Subsidiarity is binding on all branches of, of the state. The executive branch, whose task it is to apply laws in a manner compatible with the convention and to issue regulations in the same spirit. The legislative branch, which must enact laws in conformity with the convention and the judiciary. In fact, it is very important that human rights are not seen as something imposed from above, but rather embraced from below. The purpose of such a bottom-up strategy is therefore to trigger the creation of a pervasive human rights culture at the domestic level. It is to encourage rights holders and decision makers at national level to take the lead in upholding convention standards uh, and can only increase the ownership of and support for human rights. So to sum up this first part, and before I move to my second part, talking about the place of the court in the European legal system, it is extremely important to understand that this organizational framework, which is the European Convention on Human Rights, is a framework which is meant to trigger an engagement with, a respect for, and an acceptance of human rights as the basis of our democratic societies governed by the rule of law. It is not meant as a system in which international bodies impose values which are not accepted at the national level. However, 
there is a collective endeavor here. States have accepted to progress together, collectively, as an entity which is the Council of Europe. And they have accepted that they will do that by enforcing, protecting, respecting a set of fundamental human rights guarantees which are found in the European Convention on Human Rights. But how then, my second part, how should we see the role of the European Court of Human Rights in relation to domestic courts? Is it at the top of a pyramid or is it one of many key actors whose roles are different but complementary? Even though the Strasbourg Court must have the last say in ensuring domestic human rights compliance, I would not draw the conclusion that as a result, it sits necessarily at the very top of a pyramid of domestic courts. Indeed, the last decade of reform of the convention system has underlined that the system was never intended to replace national systems of control. The convention system is a collective enforcement of human rights. And as time goes on, it should give way progressively to the constitutionalization of convention principles. Now, how does it do that? One way in which this is achieved is through the embedding of the convention principles. Today, the convention is incorporated and to a large extent embedded into the domestic legal orders of the state's parties, and the court has provided a rich and comprehensive body of case law interpreting most convention rights. This enables the state's parties to play their convention role of ensuring of, uh, the protection of human rights to the full. And I'm going to deal again with this shortly. However, here I would like to mention judicial dialogue. Since 2015, the court has created a superior courts network called the SCN. Today, 93 courts from 40 countries participate in this network, which is the biggest judicial network in the world. I'm very pleased that the Portuguese Supreme and Constitutional Courts are both members. The SCN gives the possibility of exchanges of information, both vertically, that is between the court and national courts, and horizontally. It promotes easier access to the case law of the Strasbourg Court, and its aim is to create what I have termed in many of my recent speeches as the community, the European community of Strasbourg judges at the national level. You have asked yourselves and in the preparatory materials in relation to the debate you're willing to have is you have asked yourselves, how should we define the role of the court? In answer to that question, one may say that the court uh, may fulfill and does indeed fulfill more, ro more roles than one at any given time. Now, let me explain this. I have previously argued extrajudicially in some articles that I've written that the last 40 years have seen what I have termed the substantive embedding of the convention principles at the domestic level. This is, has entailed that the court has formulated its general principles of interpretation and developed its case law in most fields of convention rights. This has been a functional process aimed at progressively creating the necessary foundation for the actual realization of the convention's overarching institutional structure. This institutional structure is that it is the member states that must integrate convention principles as enunciated as provided for be in, within the interpretive process of the court and apply those principles at national level. However, it is clear that this embedding process has not impacted every state in the same way. Some states' parties are further along in this process than others. This may depend on a number of factors. For example, when the state party acceded to the convention, the state's party's own legal culture and history, the state of the rule of law, and the independence of the judiciary, etc. In states in which the substantive embedding of the convention has been largely successful, the court may in, be in a position 
to take on a more framework oriented role when reviewing domestic decision making. This review I have termed process based in the sense that the court is increasingly examining whether convention principles have in fact been adequately embedded in the domestic legal order. And if so, whether certain material elements allow it to grant deference to national authorities. This is by and large limited to qualified rights and not to core or absolute rights. As we know, when it comes to, for example, Article 3 and the prohibition against torture or ill treatment, there is no margin of appreciation. States are absolutely prohibited from engaging in behavior which falls under that provision. So we are indeed mainly talking about the principle of subsidiarity as it is manifested within cases dealing with uh, complaints lodged under Article 8, the right to privacy and family life, Article 9, the freedom to manifest one's religion, Article 10, freedom of expression, and Article 11, the uh, freedom of assembly, along with other provisions in the protocols. Now, one can ask, uh, when the national authorities have demonstrated in cases before the court that they have taken their obligations to secure convention rights seriously, what does this mean for the court's review process? It means that the court, applying a robust analysis of the principle of subsidiarity, will require strong reasons to substitute their view, our view, for those of the national authorities. The corollary is that when the member states have not integrated convention principles, have not taken on board the interpretive processes as presented by the court, the court may have to take on a more hands-on approach in its convention review. Because I really want to have more time in, in answering questions and entering the debate, let me now sort of summarize and conclude. We live in uncertain times, and I'm not just referring here to the global health pandemic. We have seen a number of recent examples of challenges to the rule of law and judicial independence in some Council of Europe member states. This brings me back to my first point on subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is not realistic without strong, independent and impartial courts at domestic level, which, fun which function within a national system that is governed by the rule of law. It flows from this that member states demonstrate with their actions whether deference is due under the principle of subsidiarity. In particular, the reasoning provided by national courts in their judgments must secure and protect their independence vis-a-vis -vis the executive and legislative branches. So to sum up, the role of the European Court of Human Rights is one of the ultimate safety valve within the European system. It does not take away and is not meant to substitute the ultimate responsibility of the member state itself to protect human rights, preserve human rights, safeguard human rights as close to its populace as possible. The European Court of Human Rights is meant to come into play when there are legitimate grounds to think that a convention state has not fulfilled the requirements under the convention. Now there, the principle of subsidiarity will create a framework of reference, will create a framework of review, which depends on various parameters. I think I'm going to end here now, Professor. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. President, for this so enlightening presentation, <clears throat> touching so many key points uh, that actually we must keep discussing uh, if we really want to have our minds on the role of the courts. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. We have a question 
already uh, from Ms. Bianca Cartagenes, uh, saying that she would like to know what Judge Spano thinks about the future of the margin of appreciation in the European Court of Human Rights. Is it possible uh, any change in the doctrine of the margin of appreciation? Thank you. That is, of course, a very difficult uh, question to answer in the abstract because one has to, when answering, look to how the doctrine has developed. The doctrine of the margin of appreciation uh, begins its development in the 1970s in famous cases against the UK, like, for example, the case of Handyside versus the United Kingdom, and has gone through developments in various fields of the convention where the court has attempted to articulate the contours of the margin of appreciation. In other words, when the margin of appreciation is considered to be wide, when it is con and it, when it's, it is considered to be narrower. What also now has happened is that with Protocol 15, the margin of appreciation as a doctrinal entity becomes a part of the text, not the text of the convention as such, but te a textual basis will be found in the preamble. Now, I'm not sure that that will as such change the nature and scope of the margin of appreciation doctrine. But I do believe that because of the close symbiotic relationship between the principle of subsidiarity and the margin of appreciation, we may see some developments uh, towards the court trying to give more flesh to the doctrine itself. But we must not forget that the margin of appreciation is a framework principle. It is a methodological tool. It is not as such uh, a, a, a doctrine which necessarily regulates outcomes. For those of you, especially the law students who want to look into the margin of appreciation and sort of the most recent articulation in the case law of the court, which I find particularly clear that is the grand chamber judgment in a, in a Czech case called Dubska and Kratzova versus the Czech Republic, which deals with uh, uh, home births, the births of children in the home of the mother, where the court tried to try, I think in a manner uh, not seen before, tried to articulate in a number of paragraphs sort of the, the contours of the margin of appreciation. My final point on that would be, because it is such a framework oriented principle, the court is very careful in, in its development of this principle, because any changes to it will, it will effectuate a change in the paradigm between the relationship uh, between the court on the one hand and the national authorities on the other. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if there are any more uh, questions. They have not come to me uh, in written form, but uh, uh, you can do it now or just raise your hand. So we have a question from Vlada Kaplina. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you very much for your speech. And uh, I cannot omit this question. I remember that last May you also gave a speech at the event organized by University of Copenhagen. And there you touched the question of uh, some challenges that uh, European Court of Human Rights was facing because of the COVID outbreak. So now it is already the one year since we've been living in the conditions of pandemic. So my question is, are there some new challenges that uh, European Court of Human Rights is facing now because of uh, pandemic? Or are there already challenges that the court has already overcome? Thank you. I, I think I would answer that question in two, two limbs. The first limb is, has the court uh, um, had to deal with we can call them practical, procedural, uh, logistical challenges in its work. 
indeed, very much so. Um, uh, my good friend, Judge Gera Martins, had to experience that head on because she was sworn in on April 1st in the middle of the first confinement in France. Uh, so there, you know, it was a very clear manifestation of how life has changed for all of us. Uh, the same can be said of, of my former colleague and also very good friend, Paolo Pinto di Albuquerque, who had to leave the court in the middle of a pandemic. So we have had to organize ourselves in the court uh, when it comes to our regular work, when it comes to section meetings, when it comes to judicial deliberations, when it comes to grand chamber hearings, all of this has to, have, we have had to change radically to be able to deal with uh, the, the, the consequences of the pandemic. Uh, I think I can safely say, and I hope Ana Maria agrees with me, that we have done that quite successfully. We have been able to deal with the, these logistical challenges in a manner which has not lowered the productivity of the court. We have been able to deliver judgments and decisions relatively unhindered by the logistical problems we face. But there is a second limb, uh, which is the jurisprudential challenge. And I, it's clear that we are still in our I uh, use the English word infancy, we are still at the start of the jurisprudential challenges we are going to be facing because of the rule of the exhaustion of domestic remedies, cases are still being litigated at national level. We do have a number of cases which have come to the court very recently, but all of these cases are at their start. They are now in the hands of judges assessing at the filtering stage and at the question of communication to what extent the court will deal with them. But it is certainly clear that there are many novel questions of convention law which will have to be dealt with by the court. Um, it goes without saying that the pandemic, a little bit in a different way like the internet, creates a novel legal paradigm. It creates a, no it creates a novelty in the way conventional law is articulated and applied. And it remains to be seen for us how we will deal with that. What we have, however, together, the judges decided is that we will try for the most important cases to be as quick as possible in Strasbourg in delivering uh, uh, decisions and outcomes for pandemic related issues so that we can provide uh, uh, an explanation, we can provide legal certainty as to sort of the most important issue when it comes to the pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question, uh, actually two questions, by Olesia uh, Tragneyuk, uh, saying that it would be interesting to know what Mr. President thinks about the correlation between so-called doctrine of European consensus and the doctrine of margin of appreciation. And also about the problem of irrelevant application of the decisions uh, of the European Court of Human Rights by national courts. So the, uh, the problem of irrelevant application okay, of uh, decisions of the European Court of Human Rights by national courts. So it's two questions. Thank you. On the first, on the first question, uh, of course, there is there is a very close conceptual correlation between uh, the notion of a European consensus on the one hand and the margin of appreciation on the other. As you know, the court has for decades been famous for its methodological tool, which we call the living instrument doctrine. This is a doctrinal uh, interpretive principle which the court has utilized to interpret the very open-ended provisions of the convention so as to take account of present day cond conditions, present, the present day situation. In other words, the court has always refused to interpret the convention in a very static um, status quo like manner, only looking to the expectations of the member states at the founding in the 1950s. Now, one of the ways in which the court has done that is to look to an emerging European consensus. 
So when there is an emerging European consensus in a particular field, that may limit the margin of appreciation. So the correlation is an inverse one. The more consensus at European level, the less margin of appreciation the states will have to take a different policy-oriented route. The most famous example of this is, of course, the field of LGBTI rights, where the court has taken on the basis of the living instrument doctrine and, a Europe, and an emerging European consensus, a rather robust approach, which again then limits the margin of appreciation. As to the second question, um, I understand it to mean uh, situations in which national courts refuse or do not apply uh, case law of the court. Now again, Article 46, Paragraph 1 of the Convention is absolutely clear. States under international law have pledged that they are bound to enforce and execute judgments of the court. Now, the question of what we've termed the erga omnis effect of court judgments is a live academic and jurisprudential debate. But it is clear that the system is premised on the idea that when the court has delivered judgment, in particular in a grand chamber case, on a particular legal question X for a particular, legal, for a particular state Y, the same legal question X should be answered in any other member state in the same manner. So national courts, under, the, 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 under their responsibility as state actors in enforcing convention principles, should of course take account of and, and, uh, and implement as far as possible judgments of the court which are applicable to the facts before them. Now, what we try to do within the concept of judicial dialogue is we try to create an awareness with our national counterparts of the immense importance that national judges respect, enforce, and protect convention principles. So it is, of course, not a good situation where we see national courts, in particular superior courts, not willing, for some reason, to follow Strasbourg case law. Now, there may, of course, be particular national issues which come into play, there may be a, a, a situation which is factually different in the case before the national court, which may justify a departure from a previously settled case law of the Strasbourg court. But the, the concept of shared responsibility, the concept of mutual recognition of our importance requires national courts to do their utmost to uh, implement and execute the judgments of the court. Thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, Beatriz Esperança asks, uh, well, first, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, question to President uh, Spano is how he believes the court should balance the principle of the margin of appreciation with the fact that the court is being asked with greater frequency to deliver judgment uh, on relatively new and awful and often political topics such as climate litigation or the rise of authoritarianism in Europe. Thank you. I think I, I to answer that, I mean, it's extremely difficult to give a general answer to, to that question, uh, but I would, make a distinction. I would make a distinction between novel issues never before dealt with by the court in a difficult policy oriented field like climate change or novel issues in bioethics uh, and so forth. I would, I would make a distinction between the challenges faced by the court in such cases and the application of the margin of appreciation and the second part of that question, which is uh, uh, risks to fundamental principles of democratic governance and the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary on the other. Because the second part of that, rule of law, democratic governance, independence of the judiciary, are core features of the convention system. There's nothing novel about those issues. 
they may be cropping up more now because of developments in the European legal space, but the underlying legal issues dealt with, they are not novel. The court has for decades dealt with rule of law issues and the court is very strong and must remain very strong on rule of law issues. When it comes to questions of democratic governance, when it comes to question of pressure being put on judges, risks to independence of the judiciary, the margin of appreciation is very narrow or non-existent. Why? Because these are structural features of the convention system. States have pledged to become a part of the European public order, which is the convention. There is no flexibility when it comes to the rule of law or the independence of the judiciary. On the other hand, when it comes to the novel issues, the first limb of the question, climate change, novel issues in bioethics, issues of that sort, well, then we are in a different paradigm. Then we, have, we are in a paradigm where law, convention law, is very underdeveloped. And the, and the principal threshold question arises, to what extent can the convention deal with issues like climate change and so forth? And that is one of the issues, as you know, we are now, we have now before us in pending cases, one coming originally from applicants from Portugal, as you know well, against many member states, where the court for the first time will have to grapple with these issues. Uh, and we will see what will be the outcome. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we have, uh, we have no other questions, but uh, I cannot help myself uh, to uh, also place a question for uh, Judge Spano. Uh, you mentioned um, the, the constitutionalization uh, or the participation of the European Convention uh, in the uh, domestic constitutionalization processes. So uh, the um, the relationship between uh, European Convention's principles and uh, the constitutionalization at the domestic level. So this uh, actually means that uh, the European Court and the jurisprudence of the Court have a role in this constitutionalization process. Uh, and I, I would like to ask you if, you if you care to amplify a bit more this idea uh, what this implies what does it really mean uh, what does it really mean for domestic constitutions thank you any member state of the council of europe which is has incorporated in accordance with their own constitutional traditions the european convention on human rights has incorporated uh, an international treaty in a field which is a quintessentially constitutional field, that is human rights. The protection of fundamental rights is a quintessential constitutional issue for all of the member states. So it goes without saying that if a member state by sovereign choice decides at the international level to become bound by a convention which as a matter of substance is symmetrical at least at the outset with its own constitutional human rights framework there will be a symbiotic development which occurs that is simply the natural natural legal develop the, the organic development between the two systems. So what that means, both short and long term, is that the legal narrative domestically, when a claim is made on the basis of a constitutional norm, which has the same manifestation in the convention, there will be a cross fertilization of the narrative, which means one cannot take place without the other. So what that means is that when national judges, national lawyers, 
national practitioners, national academics engage in a legal discourse on the constitutional features of their fundamental rights protection, that debate in the European legal space cannot take place by divorcing the convention's reach into the development at the constitutional level. The end product of that process, of course, means the constitutionalization of the two norms. They become one at the end of the day. Now, of course, this takes place in different ways in different countries. It's all a question of, again, the way in which this embedding process takes place. And it starts even in law school. It starts in the national political debate. This is, as I said, an organic process of constitutionalization. After 60 years, or after 70 years of the convention, there are many states of the Council of Europe. And, and I would say even more than half of the 47 member states where a national constitutional lawyer who is speaking about the national fundamental rights system is actually speaking about his or her national constitution along with the convention, but not as two different normative frameworks. So the constitutionalization of convention principles has been taking place for decades and it will continue to take place. Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, I would just add uh, something else. Uh, how would you relate that with Protocol 16, uh, with the possibility of, uh, of uh, questioning uh, the court by, uh, by superior courts of, uh, of states parties? Thank well, I, I would simply say that Protocol 15, uh, 16 is, a, is one more tool in our, our mutual arsenal of subsidiarity. It allows a national superior court seized of a question, an issue, which is one it feels needs answering and has not been answered by the Strasbourg court which it requires to, to, to be able to answer so as to resolve the case. So we can answer that here in Strasbourg on the basis of an advisory opinion, which means we are giving more abstract answers. Uh, there is of course a limit to how abstract we can be, uh, but it allows for an increased interaction between uh, the, the Strasbourg court and the national superior courts, which I think and as we know from the preparatory works and the explanatory report to Protocol 16 is simply meant to increase the, the interaction between uh, the two components of the system, the Strasbourg Court and the National Courts. So I think it's simply another manifestation of the overarching framework, which is one of complementarity. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can close this uh... Uh, this part of the dialogue for now uh, and uh, move on with our event. I would like to thank President Spano again for his availability and kindness to be here today discussing these matters and asking uh, and answering our questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, we would move uh, for the next uh, presentation uh, by uh, Judge uh, Anna Guerra Martins. And I would like to take this uh, uh, opportunity to uh, thank Judge Anna Guerra Martins for her help uh, on the organization of this event, which was, of course, uh, very, very uh, important. I would even say of paramount importance uh, in order for everything to go uh, to go smoothly. And I also take the opportunity to thank uh, Beatriz Esperança and Vlada Kaplina uh, that have worked with me on the organization of this uh, event. Thank you all. And I uh, immediately give the floor to uh, my dear friends and Guerra Martins. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rui. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you as scientific coordinator of the, this event and the observatory. Um, and I'd like to thank as well Beatriz Spressa and Vlad Kap Vlada Kaplina uh, for the support uh, that you have uh, done to this event and to the observatory. For me, as a, a professor of the Faculty uh, of Law uh, of the uh, University of, uh, of Lisbon, this is a proud to see. Um, I'm very proud, I have to say, to see that you have launched something that is really important. So uh, really, from the, my art, I congratulate you. I'd like to thank uh, President Spano. So uh, I'd like to greet my colleagues, uh, the colleagues who are going to, to speak, uh, Mrs. Carvalho, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Miguel, and uh, Mr. Teixeira da Mota. Uh, we, you are all um, well-known uh, lawyers and judges. Um, very, uh, very, very uh, engaged in human rights. So it's an honor to me to speak with you. And uh, I'd like to, uh, and I'd like to um, greet as well the assistants, the audience, because I, I, I'm impressed with all the, the people who are um, listening to us. Uh, I saw, for instance, uh, our permanent rep representative, uh, the, po uh, the Portuguese permanent rep representative uh, of the Council of Europe, the Ambassador uh, Gilberto Geronimo. Uh, uh, I, this is really very, very, very interesting that our ambassador, um, ambassador is with us. And uh, I saw many colleagues, for instance, Ana Rita Gil and uh, Claudia Monge, uh, and also uh, I saw uh, well-known American professors. Uh, I see, for instance, uh, Professor Patrick Huck, uh, a very well-known um, name, someone that I read some, somewhere in my life. I don't remember. Uh, really when and what, but I, I know you from name. Uh, so uh, this is for me an honor to participate. This is uh, the beginning of my uh, presentation. But uh, the, the, the subject, the topic of this webinar is so wide and so, so wide and so challenging that uh, the ones who know me uh, I'm not going uh, to be surprised when I, I see, I say that I'm going to speak about the multi-level protection of human rights and the role that the, CART, the European Court of Human Rights um, should play uh, in this multi-level multi -level protection of human rights. So starting with a brief definition for the ones who don't know me, Multi-level protection of fundamental rights or human rights, now I'm going to, to use both, term, both terms in the same, the same, uh, the same meaning, uh, seeks to express the idea uh, that fundamental rights protection in a, a certain legal space is based on different layers of norms and institutions, which overlap and intertwine to ensure an advanced degree of protection of fundamental rights. In my view, the multi-level protection of fundamental rights, which is something that I, I, I've been studying, studying for many years, uh, only makes sense when it only makes sense when it contributes to increase the protection of individuals. Transposing this rationale to the European legal space. I would say that uh, fundamental rights in Europe are protected and enforced by national, especially constitutional law, 
European Union law, it is not, uh, it is not, uh, it is not uh, good to forget. And international law, mainly the European Convention of Human Rights. Each layer has a substantive catalog, and each layer has its its own uh, judicial system. And in Europe, contrary to the rest of the world, this uh, system is a judicial system, and this system is uh, an effective system. The multi-level uh, protection uh, is supposed to give the uh, individuals more benefits and in, it, it gives to the individuals more benefits. For instance, prevents ga gaps occurring in a certain legal order. Um, the plurality of jurisdictions may contribute to common, common, uh, common um, um, principles and rules, and additional cuts can give innovative approach, innovative impetus to a deadlock jurisprudence and the new cuts, the, the, the additional cuts uh, may give uh, uh, new grounds uh, of the, uh, for the decision. So uh, this is, the, they are, these, these are the advantages of the multi-level protection. But the multi-level protection has also disadvantages. For instance, it may risk the so-called race uh, to the bottom effect. That means that uh, uh, instead of increasing the protection of the individuals, it may result in the opposite. It may result in, a, in a, uh, less protection of the individuals. It is visible. Uh, in social rights, it's very uh, visible, but uh, there are other, other, uh, other, uh, other disadvantages. The, the norms and the rules uh, belong to different, uh, to different systems, uh, and uh, it may uh, lead to contradictory deci decisions. And these contradictory decisions are contrary to the. Um, legal certainty and uh, can diminish the confidence of the individuals in the courts. So um, what, what it is important to underline is that the uh, relationship between the courts is a relationship that is not simple. This is a complex relationship. And uh, although it is mostly cooperative, there are also uh, many tensions between cuts and the many tension, tensions between catalogs as well. So uh, I'm not going to uh, elaborate on the tensions because uh, in my view, uh, what it, it is important is to highlight that the conflicts could be well resolved if you have an hierarchy of cuts. But if you don't have, which is the case, we have no hierarchy between the European Court of Human Rights and the, uh, European, uh, and the Court of Justice of the European Union and the national cuts, which is something that it's not going to change in the future. So we have to live with this premise. So the uh, only a correct mode to method to approximate the case law of the different the different cuts and to increase the protection of human rights is the cooperative dialogue between the courts. This cooperative dialogue is the key of the effective protection and enforcement of fundamental rights today, and in my view, it will be in the future as well. That means um, that, in my view, it is not changing a lot in the future. But this cooperative dialogue, in my view, presupposes, presupposes the fulfillment of three conditions. The first condition 
is the, the existence of a common axiological basis that implies the existence of common values between all the interlocutors. Second one is a sincere cooperation between all intervenings. And the third one is, a mutual, is the mutual trust. And uh, when one of these prerequisites lacks, it's very hard to protect and enforce human rights and uh, to protect and enforce human rights in a multi-level system. To be honest, I have to admit that this common axiological basis exists, but this is under threat now. And the sincere cooperation between the, 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 the Kurds, it exists. But it, it is also under threat now. And the mutual trust exists, and, but it's also under threat. I could give you many examples of these, these um, situations, but I prefer to, uh, to go on and to, to go ahead and to um, place the role of the European Court of Human Rights from this perspective of multi-level protection of fundamental rights. What is the role of the European Court of, of Human Rights? Firstly, um, let me to put the European Court in the context of the European Convention of Human Rights. This is true that in its uh, originally uh, is uh, closed, uh, the convention is closely linked to the end of the world war, uh, Second World War, and was the answer to, to systematic violations of human rights. This is true that the European Convention of Human Rights is a, multi a multilateral treaty, but it enjoys an exceptional position among international treaties. As regard its object, as regard uh, the, the, the fact that it is the only uh, treaty that creates a, a card in we, uh, in we, uh, to which the individual um, has direct access. That is, that is uh, the right to individual applications is one of the cornerstones of the European Convention system. But the convention has evolved in the last uh, in the, the last 70 years um, from an international treaty to something that it is not anymore a international treaty uh, to court. That means, uh, in my view, the convention has evolved in a constitutionalization. It's not a constitution. Uh, the ones who know me knows that I am a, a, a supporter of the European Constitution in the in the sense of the European Union. But the ones who know me know that I have already written that the the European Convention of Human Rights is not the same as the uh, European Union law. So uh, we have to talk about constitution with even more, uh, we have to be even more cautious. But the, independently of the name that you give to the thing, there is something that this is not the same as a classical international thing. Nowadays, some scholars and some politicians as well characterize the, characterize the, the European Convention of Human Rights as a, constitu a constitutional instrument of public legal order, whatever it is. But if it, uh, it is so, uh, the question that, that uh, across to my, uh, to my mind is, should the individual justice be the primary concern of the European Court of Human Rights. That means, uh, as a direct consequence of the individual justice, 
the European Court of, of Human Rights has been, has been flooded with applications, uh, which have been increasing constantly in, in number and led the court's uh, case overload. The court has sought to overcome this problem in the last uh, more than 10 years, 20 years, and to a certain extent, it has been so successful. But in my view, the number of applications will not decrease in the future because the violations will not decrease in the future. And the current pandemic, we have already talked about the pandemic with the president, but I think that the current pandemic crisis will have a tremendous impact on the protection and enforcement of human rights. And on European common values, which is much more um, complicated. History teach us, teach us that crises are usually conducive towards a disrespect of existing rules, principles, and values. And the coronavirus crisis may be a temptation to some governments to remain in an indefinitive and then uncontrolled state of emergency and to restrict fundamental rights without respecting the limits imposed by domestic and international law, by the multi-level protection of human rights. There exists the risk that the pandemic uh, is going to be used as a pretext to abusing of public power, to, to the abusing public power. So uh, there are already some examples. The suspension of the parliamentary activity in some countries, the ruling, the ruling by decree as a rule. The, restriction, the restrictions imposed to journalists, on journalists, the uh, restrictions imposed to the access, access of, inform of information, the manipulation of the uh, ele elections uh, data, the discrimination against, against the most vulnerable, vulnerable uh, Roma refugees, uh, women, uh, and uh, so on, are only some examples uh, that can illustrate the seriousness of the situation. It is und uh, undeniable that the COVID uh, is destroying many lives, globally challenging the right to life and to health, but other rights as well, uh, like the right to liberty and security, freedom of expression, freedom of, of, of um, uh, the right to private life uh, and data protection, the right to respect freedom and uh, family life, and so on. And uh, it is expectable that uh, the individual applications will increase in the future. Uh, some uh, governments declared the, the, the emergency uh, state and, and uh, uh, applied to the Article 15 of our convention, uh, are some others not. So there are, there are a lot of um, uh, response, uh, uh, different response to the same problem. And in my view, this is going to cause conflicts in the future. As the president say, we are not yet uh, dealing with them. We have only one, one case uh, due to COVID, uh, but it was an inadmissible, it was against France. Uh, but I'm convinced, I'm persuaded that um, in the future uh, it will increase. How can we um, answer this, this uh, situation? In, in such difficult times, the, uh, judder, the judiciary plays a 
huge important role. That means at all the levels, at all the layers, the judicial uh, power, the, the, the courts, are uh, uh, playing an uh, absolutely uh, important role. And, and, but it's not every cut. There are the independent cuts and the cuts who, um, which uh, are the, um, the, the supporters and the defenders of the individual freedoms and equal rights. And this is even more important in times of crisis than in times, in normal times. When human rights, rule of law and democracy are under, under threat, Kurds are the last hope of the individuals. Therefore, the individual justice cannot be underestimated. But that doesn't mean that the European Court of Human Rights has, uh, uh, should remain a court only that plays individual justice. On the contrary, the court is a, an integrative party of the European multi-judicial uh, system. Um, and in such a multi-level judicial system, the court is the, the European Court of Human Rights is the court specialized in human rights. It's not the, the court of justice of the European Union. It's not the, they, they are not the, the national courts. We are specialized in human rights. We don't deal with other, other problems. We only deal with uh, human rights. So uh, the questions, the question is, um, if the court has the last word, um, should the court deliver constitutional justice as well? That means, um, it doesn't mean that it is a constitutional court, but it, that means that the, um, the court should occupy itself with the most impact cases. That means the cases who have an impact, a huge impact in national, in national, uh, in national uh, courts. Why? Because of many, many, many reasons. Uh, because they are uh, problems that are uh, problems of uh, many people, because they are systemic uh, problems, because they are problems that are very mediatic, or etc. There are many criteria that we can, many criteria that we can imagine to. Uh, to, um, to um, describe the impact cases. For, for um, many years ago, the Kurds, the Kurds started, has started, um, I would say, um, a conception of um, uh, justice that was more close to the constitutional justice. When the court uh, introdu introduced the judicial, the single judge, the grouping of similar applications for a single decision, the admissibility criteria, criteria had, had changed, the pilot judgment, and so on. The court has no in definitive uh, infinitive uh, resources, uh, resources. So um, the court perhaps should start start for the cases which have more impact. This is uh, in many, in many, many 
to a certain extent what we are doing, doing now. But uh, the cases which have more impact is only this, this strategy makes only sense, and I'm going to finish, if, if the um, other players of this multi-level constitutional, uh, of, of, sorry, of this multi-level protection are um, also respecting the same values, the same human rights, and the same, the same, um, the same rules. Because if it is not the case, uh, we need the individual justice. To conclude, I would say that I'm not completely persuaded that we can fu fully move to the constitutional justice. Uh, I think that there is a, lo a long way to, 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 to this uh, objective, if it is an objective. Uh, I think that uh, we have to convince many countries or some countries and some judiciary and some uh, politicians and some uh, perhaps people in general uh, in some countries and not only in some countries but in Europe in, in general that this common values, the mutual trust and the cooperative uh, dialogue uh, and the, the, cooperative the cooperative confidence and the confidence between the judges is crucial to attain a more uh, effective uh, level of protection of fundamental rights. So for the ones who know me, uh, you are not surprised. It's more or less what I'm, uh, I'm uh, saying in conferences in the last 20 years. In Portugal, uh, Sam uh, think that I, I'm dreaming, uh, but uh, I have to say that the dream it's the best thing of the life so <laughs> i'm not i'm not um, concerned about this thank you very much and uh, i finish again congratulating the organization of this event thank you very much Judge Anna Guerra Martins, and uh, now I'd like to give the floor to the director of the Center for Judicial Studies, Dr. João da Silva Miguel, who is going to talk about uh, margin of appreciation. Thank you very much uh, for uh, being uh, attending this uh, webinar. I also would like uh, to thank the invitation to be uh, present at this uh, webinar to make this presentation. I would like to also to congratulate the Professor Rui Guerra Martins and his team for having prepared this conference and uh, on this topic uh, so uh, exciting and so important as well. And uh, I would like very much to, 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 to greet to all of you, but let me uh, express my warm greetings to uh, the, the, the judge and my friend Ana Maria Guerra Martins that I do not see for a long time. Uh, still to my good friend Teixeira da Mota, once again we are here and here dealing with these issues that you like so much on the, the European Convention of Human Rights. Also to uh, Fatima Carvalho, my good friend as well, that uh, is the agent for the government to the European Court of Human Rights. And I see also, perhaps there are others, but I do not see on the screen. I see Anna Rita Gil decide to join us and to attend this so much. 
And also, you know, of course, um, uh, warm greetings to all of you that I cannot uh, see all uh, on this, uh, the frame that we have in, on the screen. Well, uh, I must say that I had, uh, before preparing my presentation, I had speaking, spoken to Rui Guerra da Fonseca to try to understand who were the, the, the participants, uh, which kind of um, uh, 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 topics or matters I should uh, consider from the, that list that were on the, on the list left uh, that it was uh, sent. And uh, according to the, to, the, to, to, to the answer that I received, um, I got the impression that the majority uh, should be uh, students and that, that's why I have chosen this topic of the margin of appreciation from one side and, uh, um, uh, but I, I, um, I have uh, or I had the intention to involve uh, these topics also with uh, the other uh, principles, other uh, hermeneutical uh, uh, tools and methodological tools that the court uh, uses to better um, guarantee the, and um, give um, effectiveness to the rights uh, recognized by the European Convention on Human Rights. Having said that, and uh, because I only have 15 minutes, perhaps with, you, the, with your indulgence, perhaps more one or two, uh, I, I will try to, say, uh, to, 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 to give, um, uh, to say which is the content as a, uh, of uh, this presentation uh, on this webinar on the role of the e e uh, e uh, ECHR today and tomorrow. Uh, and I thought that it was interesting, as I mentioned already, to speak about the hermeneutics and other uh, um, methodological tools used by ECHR to apply the European Convention. Uh, I also thought that picking up one of these points, which is the margin of appreciation or state's margin of appreciation, I could give some um, development on uh, starting by the, the origins and then the development and the, about the content of uh, this uh, uh, tool and uh, if uh, possible to give some words on the future. Uh, regarding this uh, um, hermeneutics and other uh, methodological tools, I start, uh, I have here some, some, uh, some, uh, some uh, ideas. And one of these tools is the evolutive interpretation. Another one is the autonomous concepts. Still the positive obligations linked with the, the procedural dimension of uh, the, the, the task of the court uh, uh, when dealing uh, um, in, with uh, some cases. I would like also to talk about the interim measures, pilot judgments, and of course, the, 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 the margin of appreciation. Seven topics, uh, uh, two minutes, of course, uh, it, for each one. Uh, and uh, I start for this idea of uh, the evolutive interpretation. As I mentioned already, it's one of the tools that the court uh, uses and is a, an important one. Uh, the court always states, and it started in um, 78, as the first, first, first time in the, in the judgment title uh, versus the United Kingdom uh, from 25th of April, 1978, in uh, paragraph 31, were uh, where uh, the court stated that uh, must uh, be recalled that the convention is a living instrument which must be interpreted in the light of our present day conditions. This, this assessment is, um, or, or this statement better, is a of a great importance, or a great importance, because it gives a tool to the court to 
bring the content of the of the different um, rights enshrined in the convention to a, a new lecture to a new um, to, 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 to read to, to, to read them in a, a, a more um, a, a present times as the, the as the, the, the it states as the court states at the present day conditions it's also it, it's also a dynamic and progressive interpretation that broadens the scope of the protection of the convention of the conventional provisions and ensures greater effectiveness, effectiveness uh, of rights. Uh, I would like to, 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 to go in depth more uh, in some other, uh, in some um, uh, uh, judgment rendered by the court on this topic, but it seems to me that it's enough that when we are like this, this important idea, this of the evolutive interpretation as a tool for the court to have new uh, uh, to 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 go further with the wording that uh, was captured uh, within the convention um, in, the, in the in the the original text. I also would like to to mention on the uh, autonomous notions or autonomy of uh, the concepts. Uh, this is also uh, one um, one tool that has given the court uh, to the possibility to interpret the to, to the to give an interpretation of the the, the, the wording in a, a more an European sense, which means that sh the, the the court can bring and can give. Uh, a, 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 the, 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 the a new reading for the, 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 the some concepts that I enshrined in the, in, the, in the convention that even if used in the same way by the national uh, courts or by uh, the, the contra contracting parts, they have an autonomous, uh, an autonomous uh, um, uh, notion, they have a, um, they, they have a new uh, a content that is different or can be different from the national uh, 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 or the domestic uh, 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 legislations. Uh, this uh, the, the the founding judgments uh, were uh, in the beginning the, the in seventy six. It, it it's not used by the European Court of Human Rights. It's also used by the the. Um, the, the Court of Justice, uh, the, the Luxembourg Court of Justice, and they started at the same time in '76. Uh, and the, 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 the founding judgments of these autonomous notions technique uh, used by the, 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 the European Court and also by the others as uh, to ensure the, the essential uniformity of the interpretation of the um, uh, of the, 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 the European Court of Human Rights. This is, uh, and uh, when I'm talking about uh, the, the determining or determining um, civil rights and civil rights and obligations, when we are talking about uh, uh, criminal charge, when we are talking about law in Article 8 or in Article 11, victims, uh, notion of victim in Article 34, property in Article First, in Article uh, uh, Protocol One, Article First, in all these uh, um, provisions and even others, we have uh, some notions that are read in a European way, uh, uh, despite they are used in domestic um, uh, legislations as well. One. Also, one of the points, in the very important point, is that uh, used on the, by the, the, the positive obligations uh, of states. That is not the quite um, definition on this. Uh, Judge Sibrand Karol Martens, uh, um, for me, gave uh, the, 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 the best definition, which is this one. Uh, 
um, positive, uh, positive uh, obligations means that member states are required to take action. And the reason is because uh, states abstaining from taking action, this constitutes itself a violation of the recognized rights. And uh, also because the, the abstention of uh, this, a, a particular state can allow uh, private persons to interfere in this uh, recognized right. So the positive obligations have the effect of extending the requirements uh, which states have uh, to sat satisfy. And in these positive ob obligations, we have uh, two types. One, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, on a substantive uh, level uh, or a substantive, a substantive ne uh, nature. And another one is of uh, a procedural uh, sense and this uh, this uh, this uh, procedural level uh, gives uh, these procedural factors nowadays occupy a central place within the category of, of uh, positive obligations uh, it was said that uh, that uh, they constitute one of the most important contributions to case law in recent years and indeed we see uh, in the last, um, very last uh, judgments of the court that um, the, this procedural obligations, this procedural level, this procedural dimension is already uh, uh, taken in consideration uh, by the court when um, not only uh, regarding Article 2 in which uh, they appeared for the first time, but almost in all different um, rights recognized by the the, uh, the, 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 the convention. For uh, procedural uh, obligations, they are those that call for the organization of domestic procedures to ensure a better protection of persons, those that uh, uh, ultimately require the provision of sufficient remedies for violations of rights. It must be noted that the, the combination of them, these both um, substantive and the procedural dimension of uh, the positive obligations were made to make possible uh, or, or, or to considerably, considerably broaden the range of the European scrutiny as well. Still, I had some uh, ideas to talk about the interim measures. The interim measures that, that, that are the, 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 the one that is considered in Article 39 of the rules of the court, and indeed it's, it's a um, one of the major, uh, let's see, uh, let's say, uh, uh, tools that were uh, that were used, uh, uh, that is used by the court to protect uh, rights uh, that they have to 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 to, to, to guarantee, is also a, a, a measure that it's not included in the in the in the convention. It derives from the from, from the, 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 the rules of the court, and must it must be said that uh, it started in, in 81 with the judgment Cruz Varas versus uh, Sweden in uh, um, 30 uh, March 1991, where the, the interim measures were not uh, considered uh, as possible. But then the jurisprudence was reviewed, and in 2005. Fourth um, February 2005, in the case Mamad Kulov and Askarov versus Turkey, they were adopted and has been adopted as a, a, a tool used by the court to give more protection to the rights, and in particular when uh, Article 2 or 3, when the life or possible. Uh, the possibility of torture is at stake and the, 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 the person can um, be can suffer, suffer such of these uh, threats. Uh, um, 
it, it has been used, it started to be used on Article 2, as I mentioned, in particular and Article 3 as, as well, uh, in cases of um, expulsion or uh, extradition. But nowadays, the court has also used uh, this tool uh, in uh, relation to other articles uh, or other rights, better say. Still, another tool uh, not included at that time uh, in, the co in, the, the, in the European Convention were uh, uh, he is the pilot judgment. Uh, pilot judgments, um, they started in 2005. The, the, the first uh, documents adopted were adopted by the Com Committee of Ministers in 2004. Uh, with a resolution and a recommendation regarding those um, uh, judgments that reveal a systemic problem. And it was, uh, it's uh, in other um, international uh, documents, and I, there is something similar in the um, uh, Statute of the International Criminal Court where it's not called as a pilot judgment, but the, 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 the idea is the same, that in a particular case with this dimension can be given a kind of uh, a decision giving uh, general principles to uh, solve that, um, not only that, that case, but also the other cases that are related, the other cases and situations that are uh, related uh, to the, that's, uh, the, 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 the same one. And uh, still the, 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 um, the pilot judgment is uh, um, uh, Praetorian construction. The first case is now uh, in Article 61 of uh, the, the, rule of, uh, the rule of the court. And the first, the first case, which indeed um, was the, the important one is the, the Broniowski versus Poland uh, from the twenty uh, second of June two thousand and four. Uh, now it's time to go into the um, state's margin of appreciation, and uh, I must say that uh, as uh, with other tools that I've already mentioned, no provision is included in or on the European Court, uh, uh, the European Convention regarding this, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this, 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 this tool. Of course, as um, President Spano already mentioned, now in 2013, following the conclusions of uh, the, the Brighton Conference and the, um, the, 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 the works that were done within the Council of Europe, the Protocol 15 was adopted and the uh, recital was, uh, was um, uh, included in the preamble of the uh, European Court. Of course, uh, even if uh, this, it, it was not included in the um, in the European Co in the European Convention, the really the reality is that thousands and thousands of judgments have been rendered, and uh, this uh, um, Praetorian construction, as I have, meant, I have already said, uh, started. Firstly, with the first um, judgment already mentioned by um, President Spano, the case Andy side in on the seventh uh, December, nineteen seventy six. Uh, this is this was um, uh, related to a, a particular case uh, uh, on. Uh, on uh, the, the moral uh, issues, I must say. But even in this, uh, before this NDK, the, the NDSI case, 
others have already in other uh, in other judgments have the 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 the, 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 the doctrine of the margin of appreciations had already men have been mentioned in the Belgian linguistic case in the, the 68 and also the world uh, home and uh, versi versus uh, Belgium in uh, 71. This, 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 this case was related to some uh, uh, to, to article 8 and uh, the facts were related to some vagrants that were detained for one year. And it was considered that this interference in the life of, um, of uh, the, 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 the family life and familial life of uh, these, um, uh, these vagrants were considered as transgre uh, transgressing the limit of the uh, power of appreciation by, by state. What is important is that this case, um, that the, in the case and decide the principles um, that were followed afterwards were there very well uh, um, uh, exposed. And we must say, according to a category that was already, in, uh, that was already uh, presented, some points uh, uh, must be highlighted. One, one is the, the deference. When the deference uh, went to uh, concurring jurisdictions uh, have, uh, on the same, um, uh, 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 when uh, there are so some, uh, as I mentioned, the, the one of the, 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 the characteristics of this um, margin of appreciation is the deference that I already, I already said. And it appears uh, when um, concurring jurisdictions um, on the same or different or in similar matters have uh, competence, which means that there is a kind of, there is a, a judicial dialogue between those uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the idea that is behind is that, is that the, the, the courts uh, in one jurisdiction should um, respect and demonstrate a degree of deference to the law of other jurisdiction, including the decision of judicial bodies operating in this uh, uh, jurisdiction. Of, uh, as was uh, expressed by one uh, author. Having said that, you immediately understand that there, the, 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 there is the other, the other side, the other face of the issue is the, the subsidiarity. The subsidiarity means that the national courts or national authorities are in the better position to uh, guarantee the protection of uh, human rights with the special reference to national culture or national traditions. And this point, this rises immediately the other face of the issue, which is the, uh, the supervision. And the, here it's here that the European Court appears uh, because the European Court on Human Rights reserves to itself the role of supervision and monitoring of uh, the concrete application of the margin of appreciation. Uh, it, the, 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 the supervision appears when uh, at the national level, uh, there is an, an interference of the right and such interference must be, uh, uh, should, should or, or shall uh, consider some, uh, um, uh, some 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 um, some characteristics. One of them that must be uh, this must be provided by law. The other is the uh, um, the, the legitimate aim, and the other one, if they are needed, if the, the these interferences are needed in a democratic society, and that's here. 
where the consensus and the proportionality appear. Because the court goes to, to look into the different uh, um, uh, legislations of different uh, states or even contract, uh, contracting parties better to see if there is a common ground on different uh, uh, contracting parts uh, in the sense that it's a consensus, but it's not needed the unanimity in this point. And uh, uh, if there is a, a consensus exists in a particular point, uh, so um, which means that uh, um, the, 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 the national authorities are, uh, let, let's say, with a safeguard because this is the general uh, position of um, uh, of uh, the, 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 the the, the, the different contracting parts. But if uh, a consensus exists in a way that is different than the one that was adopted by the, 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 the defendant uh, um, state, though this means that then in this case, the margin of appreciation of the state of the contracting part is very narrow. And um, uh, the, 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 it must comply with such a, such a consensus. The proportionality uh, means, uh, and the, 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 the proportionality and the necessity of the, 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 of the of the, the, the that solution uh, you know, that option in the society uh, democratic society uh, means that the domestic uh, rule is needed to uh, to pursue a, a general interest and uh, that the margin of appreciation exercised by national court is pro proportionate. I must say that not all uh, um, rights uh, enshrined in the convention allows a margin of appreciation. Article 15 clearly uh, mentioned it. And the, the, we also, not only have, uh, Article 15, but uh, still other articles and other rights uh, in different protocols um, also uh, can be considered as no allo not allowing this margin of appreciation. Uh, but in general, when the margin of appreciation is admitted, we must say that th there is a kind of uh, variable geometry for them. Uh, and the, in some issues that are uh, uh, a wide margin of appreciation and it can be seen that in some um, moral uh, moral subjects, moral matters, uh, some national traditions, uh, some, some others uh, um, uh, solutions, kind of uh, religions, if you remember the, the, the use of the integral veil, the, the case of uh, 2000 and the, the, the economic also have shown that in some social rights, uh, even if they are not considered in the convention, but when they are linked with the, 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 the articles uh, provided for in the convention, in the rights in, uh, provided for in the convention, uh, there are in this, in this situation a margin of appreciation, uh, a wide margin of appreciation for uh, states. Uh, um, what can be said still is that um, I think, or, can, or it can be said, as was pointed out by the, the judge um, uh, the, 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 at the time in 2012 in the Brighton conference uh, by the, the, the president of the court at the time, Sir Nicholas Bratza that the, the margin of appreciation and the, 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 the principle of subsidiarity are 
very linked. Uh, they, uh, um, they are uh, very linked, uh, very, uh, very linked between the, 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 the margin appreciation and subsidiarity are very, very close to. And uh, it's, it's, it seems to me that at that time you were saying also that uh, they should have continued to, to, to be brought before the court when he stated that one of the principal characteristics of a court is a system governed by the rule of law and uh, its independence. And in order to fulfill its role, the European Court must not only be independent, it must also, it must also be seen to be independent. That is why we, and I underlined this, that is why we are, and I have to say, uncomfortable with the idea that governments can in some way dictate to the court how its case law should evolve or how it should carry out the judicial function, functions conferred on it. Uh, having said that, it seems to me that both of uh, the margin of appreciation and the subsidiarity, now that they are included in the, the convention in the preamble, they still continue. Of course, this is, it's not possible perhaps in each situation to see which is the, the solution, but indeed in a case by cases, they have to be, they, they will be always present uh, because according to the other um, tool that I have already mentioned, the rights enshrined in the convention are always to be interpreted in an evolutive way and if they are interpreted in an evolutive way, they are always um, filled to new solutions, new approach, new uh, um, uh, possible different opinions that court in this task of uh, uh, monitor and supervise the, the, the and guarantee the rights uh, enshrined in the, in the convention, and the other side, uh, uh, contracting parts that do not see the same way. So, sorry for taking so much time. My apologies for that. And it, that's what I had to say on this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Miguel. I would now like to pass the floor to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Maria Fatima Carvalho, who is the agent of the Portuguese state with the European Court of Human Rights. Her uh, intervention will be in French. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je commence pour uh, remercier cette invitation et pour féliciter uh, cette organisation, ce débat. Uh, je profite aussi pour féliciter notre juge, Ana, Garci, Ana Guerra Martins, que je ne voyais pas depuis son élection. Et je profite aussi pour, uh, uh, pour uh, uh, manifester mon plaisir de revoir uh, mon collègue Jean Miguel et aussi l'avocat Teixeira da Mota, qui sont les habituels compagnons de ces débats. Uh, J'ai pensé un peu euh, ce que pourrait être euh, la valeur ajoutée de mon intervention. Euh, en fait, je suis une praticienne. Euh, depuis dix ans que je travaille devant la cour en tant qu'agent du gouvernement portugais, et ce que je connais euh, mieux sont les procédures adoptées par la cour et les décisions qui sont rendues par la cour et les problèmes euh, que ces procédures et que ces décisions euh, peuvent porter euh, du point de vue des États. Et parfois, j'ai aussi euh, la perception des problèmes qui peuvent euh, arriver aussi avec euh, les requérants, bien sûr. Alors, euh, j'ai pensé que je pourrais parler un peu des nouvelles procédures qui ont été adoptées par la Cour pendant les dernières années. Euh, 
d'une façon générale, ne sont pas bien connus encore pour toute la communauté juridique. Ils ne font pas, ils ne font pas l'objet euh, des protocoles, euh, des, parfois et même du règlement de la Cour. Ils sont communiqués euh, aux agents et parfois ils sont aussi divulgués au site de, de la Cour. Euh, et si bien qu'il s'agit des questions apparentes apparemment d'ordre pragmatique, il y a des implications sérieuses, euh, soit sur les décisions qui sont rendues au final de la requête, soit en ce qui concerne les valeurs et les principes sur lesquels repose le, le système du contrôle juridictionnel de la Convention. Alors, j'ai décidé de parler des plus récentes euh, utensiles que la Cour a adopté euh, pour traiter, pour décider et même pour prioriser les requêtes. Je vais parler euh, du traitement euh, des requêtes répétitives, je vais parler de la phase conciliatoire, je vais parler de la procédure dite simplifiée, je vais parler de la procédure WECL, well, well, established case law et euh, pour finir je vais parler euh, des nouveaux critères de priorisation des requêtes qui a été réça euh, très récemment adopté par la Cour. Alors euh, en ce qui concerne les requêtes répétitives, euh, vous savez euh, c est, c est sûrement que la Cour a adopté une, euh, un moyen plus célère et plus légère, plus abrégée, on peut dire, pour résoudre une grande quantité des, euh, des requêtes qui concernent le même problème. D'une façon générale, il s'agit d'un problème d'ordre systémique qui existe dans euh, l'État en cause et que la Cour les agroupe, les traite en conjoint, les communique par des grands groupes, peut-être parfois, euh, et que les, euh, tout, le, tout le déroulement de la requête, c'est plus clair. Elle est décidée par un comité de trois juges, ou même, euh, on pense, par un juge. Euh, et euh, euh, les, les décisions sont moins motivées. Euh, tout ça, bien, bien compris, pour faire face à une grande quantité des requêtes qui concernent le même problème qui est déjà connu. Je comprends bien euh, cette option, mais toutefois, il y a trois euh, principes que je pense que doivent être toujours le principe, qui n'est pas en cause à ce moment, mais que je pense que doit euh, être toujours, toujours dans notre esprit, c'est le principe de l'intervention du juge. Ces requêtes même qu'elles sont faciles à résoudre, elles doivent toujours exiger l'intervention d'un juge, même si la formation judiciaire est composée par un nombre inférieur de juges. Le deuxième principe, c'est le contradictoire. Je suis toujours impressionnée, dès le, dès le début, de, dès le moment que j'ai commencé à exercer ces fonctions, avec une formule que la Cour utilise parfois dans ces types de requêtes, quand elle nous dit qu'il n'a pas besoin de nos observations. C'est quelque chose qui m'impressionne, parce que je pense que dans, euh, dans, un procès, dans une procédure judiciaire, les parties doivent toujours euh, se prononcer euh, et vérifier si les faits sont exacts, parce que parfois il y a des requêtes abusives, euh, et aussi pour vérifier si la question soulevée est exactement la même qui a été déjà connue par la Cour. Alors, je pense que le contradictoire, c'est toujours nécessaire, même dans ce type de, de requête et dans ce type de procédure. Et pour finir, euh, la motivation de, euh, des décisions. Euh, la, la motivation pourra être plus légère, mais nous devons connaître les raisons euh, pour lesquelles la décision euh, a été rendue dans un ou dans autre sens. En ce qui concerne euh, la nouvelle phase de conciliation, la Cour a décidé, euh, dans un grand nombre de requêtes, d'inviter les parties au début de la requête euh, 
d'aboutir à une résolution à l'amiable. Et parfois, la Cour, elle suggère même euh, le, les termes de cette proposition. Euh, pour moi, je suis complètement favorable à l'introduction de cette phase. Je pense qu'elle a été très utile. Beaucoup des, des requêtes euh, sont résolues euh, dans un temps très bref. Et, et d'après la volonté des deux parties, aucune personne n'est obligée accepter cet accord. Mais si les deux parties sont d'accord, c'est une bonne manière euh, de faire face à toute cette euh, pendance euh, qui, avec laquelle la Cour est confrontée. Alors, je suis favorable euh, à cette phase. Je vois qu'elle soulève euh, euh, des problèmes très importants. Euh, et je passe à la procédure dite simplifiée. Euh, en ce qui concerne cette procédure, j'ai quelques réserves. Euh, cette procédure a été conçue et annoncée par la Cour il y a trois ou quatre ans, je pense, et elle a été annoncée comme euh, visant les requêtes les plus simples, les requêtes qui ne soulevaient pas des problèmes nouveaux ni des problèmes complexes. Euh, toutefois, ce qui s'est passé, parfois, c'est le contraire. Par exemple, la première fois que le Portugal a été confronté avec une requête traitée sur cette modalité, la procédure simplifiée. Cette procédure concernait une affaire peut-être un des plus, des plus importantes, des plus complexes de l'histoire judiciaire portugaise, l'affaire BPN concernant une complexe fraude financière et bancaire. Alors, qu'est-ce qui se passe Dans cette procédure, la Cour, différemment de ce qu'elle fait dans les autres requêtes, elle n'élabore pas au début de la requête un exposé des faits qui délimite dès lors l'objet de la requête. Elle laisse aux parties de faire euh, ses exposés, de soulever les faits de, de, et de contester le, la partie contraire, de les contester d'une façon spécifiée, cas euh, fait par fait. Alors, ça, c'est normal, ça se passe dans les, nos, nos juridictions internes, mais si nous, euh, trans, euh, si nous transférons cette procédure pour euh, une affaire très compliquée, très complexe, euh, ce qui arrive, c'est que nous avons centaines ou milliards d'effets et de documents qui sont présentés et qui sont soulevés. La réponse de l'autre partie, même de l'État, parce qu'il est confronté avec la nécessité de tout contester, sous peine de, que ce fait que non contesté soit considéré établi, ça va faire aussi de la partie de l'État une opposition très détaillée, très développée. Et quand cette, quand cette affaire arrive à la phase décisionnelle, il, il, est, il a assumé une grande, un grand volume. Euh, euh, il s'est transformé parfois, ce qui est arrivé dans ce cas, dans un méga process, on peut, on peut dire. Alors, nous aurons devant la Cour la réalité que nous connaissons devant nos juridictions, des procédures euh, énormes, avec des centaines d'effets, quelqu'un pertinent, quelqu'un non pertinent, et la, la distinction qui n'a pas été faite au début devra euh, être faite à la phase décisionnelle. Alors, l'allègement du travail de la Cour au début ira à se réfléchir dans une charge de travail très lourde dans la phase décisionnelle. Je vois avec préoccupation euh, la façon dont la Cour euh, va trancher euh, euh, ces, ces requêtes très complexes qui n'étaient pas celles pour lesquelles cette procédure a été conçue. Et pour finir sur cette nouvelle procédure, je parlerai sur le, la procédure WECL. 
uh, well-established case law. Alors, uh, la Cour, de, uh, par cette procédure, uh, renvoie la décision d'une uh, nouvelle requête uh, pour, uh, par une autre décision déjà rendue contre le même État ou contre un autre État uh, qui, qui a uh, analysé et décidé la même question. Alors, nous avons euh, le premier problème, c'est celui de savoir si la question est la même ou si elle est identique. Euh, nous avons dès lors, au début, euh, une euh, question qui se prête à, à la controverse. Et parfois, les États soulèvent cette question, que la question ou, les, ou les requérants, que la question n'est pas similaire, n'est pas identique. Euh, un autre, euh, nous avons la question que cette procédure soulève aussi, qui c'est la question euh, plus juridique euh, de l'efficace erga omnes des arrêts de la Cour. Si l'arrêt intérieur si est contraignant pour euh, un autre État, ça soulève la question de l'efficace euh, de facto en droit de la res judicata, res interpretata. interpretata. Alors, euh, euh, cette procédure se heurte avec ces questions juridiques. Et pour finir, l'autre la, question que peut se poser, c'est la question, le problème de l'assimilation au niveau interne d'une décision qui est rendue dans une affaire contre un État, mais qui applique une doctrine qui a été, euh, qui a été euh, définie vis-à-vis d'une -vis autre réalité et un autre système juridique différent. Alors, parfois, il pourra y avoir des problèmes d'assimilation et de compréhension au niveau interne avec euh, ces décisions. Euh, et pour conclure, je vais parler un peu d'un sujet récent dont la juge Anna Guerra Martins a déjà parlé, qui c'est la question de la priorisation des requêtes. La Cour a annoncé euh, la dernière semaine, je pense, euh, au moins d'une façon publique, elle a annoncé les nouveaux critères de, de priorisation qui se fonde sur la, les, le critère de l'impact. Alors, nous avons, euh, euh, nous avons déjà des critères de priorisation au fil du temps. Euh, les, critères, les requêtes prioritaires sont toujours celles qui concernent les situations d'urgence, les violations les plus graves du noyau dur des, des droits fondamentaux, et les personnes vulnérables. Euh, maintenant, nous aurons d'autres critères un peu différents qui vont concerner... Euh, euh, je vais consulter parce que j'ai lu euh, seulement il y a peu de temps. Mais ces critères vont se fonder sur euh, le fait que la requête euh, va... Euh, impliquer ou non une modification de la loi ou de la pratique interne ou internationale. Si la requête soulève une question d'ordre mo moral ou sociétal, euh, et si l'affaire soulève des questions, euh, de, de, nouveau, de nouvelles questions, je pense que ce sont les droits émergents, ou une problématique significative dans le domaine des droits de l'homme. Alors, ceux-ci sont les premiers critères. Mais dans un, un deuxième moment, il y a un autre critère. Et ce deuxième critère sera celui de la médiatisation ou de la possibilité politique de l'affaire. Euh, alors, euh, ce sont des nouveaux critères. Je pense qu'on parle des affaires d'impact. Je pense que c'est un sujet qui va exiger une réflexion qui va 
peut-être peut porter des modifications importantes. Et euh, je dois dire euh, euh, de, de mon avis que j'ai quelques craintes sur euh, un critère de média, qui se fonde sur la médiatisation ou même sur la sensibilité politique de l'affaire. Euh, je crains que, euh, à l'avenir, euh, les hommes publics, les hommes politiques seront les principales les victimes devant la cour, en détriment des, des personnes anonymes euh, qui ont des requêtes qui ne sont pas médiatiques, même parce que les médias, euh, ils n'existent il ne mérite pas l'attention des médias. Alors, j'ai quelques réserves, on va voir ce qui va se passer, euh, mais je pense que euh, l'avenir devra toujours se fonder sur l'essentiel. La cour, comme une cour des citoyens, qui se fonde sur la, le droit de requête individuelle, des citoyens qui ont le droit de présenter leur requête, qui ont le droit de voir leur requête tranchée sur un pied d'égalité. Et les critères de priorisation, je pense, que doivent rester sur la question de l'urgence, de la vulnérabilité et de la gravité euh, des lésions. Je vous remercie. Merci. Merci bien. Uh, I think that we just found one of the topics to one of our next webinars uh, because this last uh, this last topic uh, really really has a structural impact in the way the court uh, is going to work uh, in the future uh, so th thanks a lot for for bringing this to to this webinar i'm sure there will be questions at the end regarding this uh, and we are now giving the floor to mr tesher da mota i am uh, i am very curious uh, with his intervention uh, i am very curious to know if uh, the lawyer looks at the european courts as a potential alternative to a constitutional court namely uh, but we will see. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you. You shouldn't be so curious. No reason for that. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Rui Garda Fonseca and the Observatory, to have invited me to participate in this webinar. Uh, it's an honor uh, to work with the people that are in this webinar, but it's also a pleasure because uh, the European Court is uh, a reality that is very dear to me, so it's really a pleasure to be here. I have to send a special hug to my friendly enemies, Dr. João and Dr. Fatima, because they usually are my enemies in the court, but they are friendly enemies. So it's a pleasure that I see them again, although through Zoom, it's not the best way, but it's the way possible. As a lawyer, I am a, a practitioner. I'm someone who doesn't study very much. Lawyers don't study very much. They are all, always fighting the battles in the courts. So they not talk like teachers, but um, we get the experience of finding out the realities through the courts. And uh, my modest contribution will be not really a presentation, but uh, I would say a personal testimony um, of my experience as a, a Portuguese lawyer uh, with the court in the field of Article 10 of the Convention. And through that, I'll try in a way uh, show the importance and the need, the need for uh, our court. Well, I entered in this court in the field of co European court in the 80s of last century through the, the hands, by the hands of the, Dr. Jorge Sampaio, that would later become the president of the Republica Portuguesa. Uh, by that time, he was an excellent lawyer. Uh, it's better than being a, the president, of course. 
and he had, he had a, a case of uh, violation of Article 6, the right to a fair trial, the right to a fair trial within a reasonable time. And he had been invited to be a member of the then European Commission of Human Rights. At that time, there was no uh, European Court. There was only the European Commission. Uh, invite me uh, to replace him because there was a, a conflict of interest. And so I started uh, studying the European Convention. Then I, later on, I spent a month in Strasbourg studying international law and international mechanisms of protection of human rights. And as far as I remember, I lodged some uh, applications uh, for violation of the same Article 6. It was very easy, still is, but it was very, very easy in Portugal because <laughs> almost every court had uh, cases that were not uh, solved in due time. So it was easy at that time to lodge this kind of uh, application. But in 1997, I lodged an application that would have a great impact and bring important improvements, I think, in Portuguese uh, legal and social reality. Uh, this was the Vicente, it's called Vicente Jorge in Portugal, in, in the uh, case law of the court, it's uh, Lopes Gomes da Silva uh, case versus Portugal. It was decided in, in the year 2000. And it was the first time that the, the court uh, uh, hold that unanimously, that Portugal was responsible, had violated uh, Article 10 of the convention. So for the first time, uh, there was someone from the outside of this country saying that you have a weak protection of freedom of expression. The way you look at freedom of expression is not the way you should look. It's not the way that your international obligations make you look at, at, at it. So you have to change your uh, idea of what uh, uh, freedom of expression is. I remember that uh, at that time, and I took here some notes that the court said some, some, there are some expressions that are very important because they are novelties to the Portuguese system. Not only, of course, the, the, the idea of the pressing social need and things like that, but there were some about freedom of expression that, in that freedom of expression, of course, is a, a, a essential foundation because there is the individual aspect of someone who has the right to say and think and write what he wants, but because society also improves receiving all that information. After all the, the uh, free flow in the market of ideas, uh, th that's important. But there were things more important that they were said at that time by the European court, uh, just like, but first they remember one of the important things that afterwards uh, they appeared in many Portuguese court decisions, that is the sentence from President Harry Truman, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. So this is something that improved the reality in, 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 the, in our court decisions about the freedom of expression. I remember the first time I told it in, in Portugal in a court, and I remember the first time it appeared written in a, a decision. It's important because it's a very clear idea of the importance of mainly public figures and politicians and the people of power to accept criticism. Well, uh, then there were two or other sentences that the, the court said that were important for Portugal. And I think it were in some way, not only for Portugal. Uh, one was that journalist freedom also covers possible recourse to a degree of exaggeration or even provocation. That was very important because in Portugal, there was the idea that the journalist had to be uh, very strict in the critics and could write not too much. You had to respect. Uh, uh, so uh, exaggeration or provocation were not allowed by our courts. Uh, they said that the, the people who wrote that or said those things that were exaggerated or that were provocative uh, were uh, beyond the limits of uh, freedom of expression. So uh, the other uh, sentence that was important from uh, the decision in Lopes Gomes da Silva was that political invective often spills over into personal sphere. Because if you say uh, this, that as the singer 
uh, sang very badly uh, is one thing. If you say the, sing the singer is very bad, is another. Is what they did or is a very bad person? Is that, well, it, they explained that uh, when you are in this kind of debate or discussion, uh, of course, it spills into the uh, personal sphere. It has to attack the personally in a way or another, but it has to do it. We can't uh, split the two questions, the work, the uh, l'oeuvre, uh, the artist. No, it's together. And when you criticize, you criticize both of things. You have to say that freedom of expression has to uh, 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 protect uh, both uh, uh, both things. Well, I, I must say very quickly, uh, I don't know exactly who is uh, listening or, or seeing this uh, webinar, but it must be said that in Portugal, uh, freedom of expression has not been a particularly uh, protective value over the centuries. Uh, even since the democratic uh, regime in 17, uh, 1974, there is a paralyzing, in my idea, concept that uh, in Portugal it's, it said, respeitinho uh, é muito bonito. Uh, I would translate it in the respect is a very beautiful thing. I don't know what's the best way to translate it, but this is a concept that has dominated the Portuguese legal and social reality for many, many years. Uh, well, uh, from this concept, from the acceptance of this concept, of course, lots of uh, 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 matters uh, escaped from the scrutiny of public opinion. Basically, basically, in my opinion, there was a rejection of confrontation of ideas and opinions, often, often subservient to the power um, in this prevailing society and in courts. Uh, so the natural uh, decisions in uh, freedom of press or freedom of expression were always in favor of honor or reputation, good name in the confrontation of those two values. So freedom of expression in Portugal was uh, uh, a fundamental right in the constitution, but in fact, it was a poor relative uh, in the Portuguese courts to the other in confrontation with the other fundamental rights. Uh, for instance, I remember too at that time, we wouldn't see much in Portuguese, or any Portuguese decision courts about freedom of expression that would distinguish between uh, facts and value ju judgments. It would be more, more or less the same. So uh, there were many decisions that uh, would say that opinions were not true and uh, there were convictions uh, about opinions. Well, um, 10 years passed from 2000 to 2010. In 2010, we had another case. In, in the meantime, there were nine cases that Por Portugal was held uh, responsible for a violation of Article 10. Uh, and they all had uh, value and impact. But in 2010, you had another case. It was the Publico, Publicação Social SA uh, uh, versus Portugal. It was important. Why? Because it was, uh, it had a football club, and having a football club is something that in Portugal uh, is paramount. It's, it's of enormous importance. Whatever you say, whatever they do, it's paramount. And had no paying of taxes what is interesting also in our country. So uh, uh, this was a case that the uh, public was a newspaper and is a newspaper, daily newspaper, and had been convicted. Uh, why? Because the Portuguese Supreme Court uh, 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 convicted the newspaper to pay a huge compensation to the football club because they saw that the veracity of news was of little interest. As the judges wrote, and I, here I'm quoting, uh, translating and quoting, this is a concrete conflict between the right to reputation of a legal person with public recognition and utility, this was a football club, and freedom of press, which can only be resolved in favor of the first of these rights to the detriment of the second. This is what's clear for them, no doubts about it. It was the uh, reputation good name of a legal person, it's not even an individual, it's not even the honor, it's just the uh, reputation of a football club about taxes it's a joke <laughs> speaking about football clubs and taxes it's a joke to say that it's, it's, there is any offense in that but it was the way it was decided um well uh, because the the supreme court 
uh, in their understanding, uh, and, and they reason that way, they wrote it, uh, the journalists, since they had found the document from the Ministry of Finances that said there was a debt that was not paid by the football club, but the football club had denied the debt, and the Ministry of, uh, the, Ministry of the IRS had said that they couldn't, uh, invoking the fiscal secrecy, they couldn't comment on the case, they, they had not to write it. They decided that the, the journalists were supposed not to write about it because the document that the, the journalists had was a confidential document that uh, was not issued by the ministry. So the, the judges of Supreme Court decided that the, the journalists should not write about it uh, because they had no confirmation. Sure. Of course, the, 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 our court, and I think here we are speaking about, I can say our court, uh, it's the court, as it says about itself, uh, was not convinced by this argument uh, and said, that, of course, a journalist with a situation such as that to renounce the publication would be uh, consenting uh, enormous limitation of the rights of journalists. So in this case, the Supreme Court had, just like in the other case, decided that freedom of expression had a very weak value in Portugal. And the European court came and said, no, it's different from that. And this had a huge impact because all the decisions from the courts before, all it's a way of saying, of course, there were some that were not like this, but most of the decisions were always in the confrontation between, between re uh, reputation and uh, uh, freedom of expression in favor of reputation. And that changed. The important thing here is that in Portugal, the European court changed the decision, changed the reality, but it changed in a, in a very significant way. Because I, first I have to speak about the constitutional court and to say, uh, uh, well, when people ask me uh, or think if the European court is a, a constitutional court, I say, of course, yes, it is. I'm saying that from a long time ago. Why? <laughs> because the Portuguese constitutional court has, uh, um, has no right, has no jurisdiction to decide upon uh, the, the unconstitutionality of the decisions, only about the rules, uh, only about the law. And so in both cases, in this case of the club, football club and, and club, and in the other case, I went to the constitutional court and, but it was uh, to no avail because they said they couldn't uh, decide on that, those cases. They, they accepted, uh, the, they received the, the appeals, but then they said their jurisdiction is limited to review the constitutionality of legal provisions. And so they couldn't decide anything. So after the constitutional court, I went to the European court. And in both court, uh, uh, cases, uh, we were right. And we had the constitutional court that didn't fulfill his duties, not its legal duties, but its duties as a constitutional court in a country. So for me, of course, the European court is a constitutional court because it decides on the fundamental rights. It decides uh, uh, from law questions, from, I would say, not, not, not saying that the constitutional court is a political court, but in part, in some way it is because it's in the constitutional courts that the great principles are to be discussed and are to be confronted. And I think the European court does that. Well, there was enormous importance uh, of the decision of the European court. And interestingly, in Portugal, we have a difference uh, between the uh, super, super, uh, Supreme Court and the appellate courts. Uh, in the Supreme Court nowadays, the um, case law of the European Court and the, the decisions and the reasoning and the understanding of the scope of the uh, Article 10 is uh, uh, accepted by the Supreme Court. Uh, it is accepted in a very strong way with very good decisions from 2010 uh, onwards. Uh, in 2011, we have a good decision, then we have more. And it, they even come, there is a conclusion, there is a decision 
a, a recent, more or less, a recent decision where the Supreme Court says, states uh, explicitly that, well, we rather, we rather decide and have a good dialogue with the European Court, because if not after, people will complain in the European Court. And the Portuguese state, what means uh, all of us, the public purse, the taxpayer, will have to pay the money back to those who complained to the European Court. Because uh, uh, when the European Court convicts Portugal, let's say, to pay that amount, is the taxpayer that is paying what was paid before wrongly. So they even say that <laughs> in a, such a practical way, a, such a pragmatic way. So this is the Supreme Court. In the appellate courts, we have some decisions, uh, recent de decisions, uh, last two, three years, where in Lisbon, uh, those, those are the ones I know, where they say in those decisions that uh, we can't accept the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court because they give more value to the freedom of expression that, than to the other fundamental rights. And the Portuguese constitution says that the fundamental rights have all the same value. So uh, this interpretation of the European Court and this, uh, I would say, apl application of the way it's, 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 it's done in the, Supreme, in the European Court with the freedom of expression is unconstitutional. So there are already some cases where the courts in the uh, appellate court of Lisbon has decided that way, uh, although after it came to the Supreme Court that overturned these decisions. It's good to remember that from 2007, we have law, to, to, to ch there were changes in law that uh, now uh, a judgment that uh, went to an international jurisdiction with a binding on Portuguese state where it's not uh, acceptable, there is incompatibility between those decisions, there is the, uh, uh, there is, uh, the possibility of reopening the case and I have already two cases where someone was convicted here, went to the Supreme, to European Court, the European Court declared there was a violation of Article 10, and then we asked the Supreme Court here to reopen the case, and the two people that were convicted before were acquitted. So it works, it, it shows that the, our system uh, uh, protects nowadays, in most cases, but not in all, because you have, after all, two currents, two trends, as I was telling you, uh, about uh, the uh, European Court. And it's the European Court case law that uh, uh, makes the difference between the two currents in uh, our the decision of our courts. About the prioritization that uh, uh, Dr. Fatima was uh, speaking, I think it's very important because the, the, the freedom of expression cases are, I suppose, in level uh, category four, uh, uh, which is not the most important, and it's not the least important. And uh, they took, they take years and years, and I don't know when they will be decided. Although freedom of expression is so important, it, it, I think nowadays they are losing importance. And for Portugal, they are quite important because uh, there is this difference of interpretation. There is these two currents of uh, legal thought in the courts, and it would be important that more cases uh, would be decided. Uh, I think the, 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 the decision, uh, what are the cases in the category four that have impact, the court should ask to, to the previous judges uh, of the countries, because they know how do the court works, and they know the reality of the, the, the country. So it would it'd be important to get their opinion uh, to choose which cases have an impact uh, to uh, prioritize those cases. Well, these are um, my most uh, important thoughts in my uh, testimony. I just want to finish uh, my modest contribution to stress the importance of the court in the Portuguese judicial system, uh, telling you a joke, a joke that was usual between judges in Portugal. Well, 
one just uh, asked the other what's the difference between the judges from the plate court and the judges from the Supreme Court. And the answer is, well, the judges, is or was, uh, the judges from the plate court seek they are God and the judges from the Supreme Court, they are God. Well, nowadays with the European Court of Human Rights, uh, uh, thank God, thank God, came to disturb this theological uh, equation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, your very lively presentation. I guess my curiosity was, after all, satisfied with a very, very uh, specific answer. You couldn't be more clear than you were. Uh, so now let's open the let's open the debate. We have a window of uh, let's say about twenty minutes. Um, we have listed uh, a certain number of uh, questions. I would ask Beatriz if she could open the floor on this because she summoned them up. Um, so please. Yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, questions. I'll start with the ones for uh, Judge Ana Guerra Martins. Um, okay, I'll, I'll read. I'll them. read. Uh, um, I'll read the questions for Ana Guerra Martins. Um, so one question is from Olesia Tragniuk. Uh, Olesia says, my question is a bit consonant with the previous one from Ana Rita Gil. Speaking about the multi-level protection of human rights in Europe, we must also remember about the system of protection of rights that is being formed in the EU. How do you assess the capabilities of the human rights protection system in the EU? How effective can it be? Uh, so this is one of the questions. Then there are two from uh, Ana Rita Gil. Um, Ana Rita says, well, first of all, she thanks uh, Professor Ana Guerra Martins for the wonderful and enlightening uh, lecture. And then she asks, um, I would like to ask you where the principle of the more favorable level of protection could work, in your opinion, as a principle that could solve the conflicts related to multi-level and at the same time, avoid the risk of decreasing the level of protection. Could this work in the European Court of Human Rights, despite the margin of appreciation, at least for the countries which foresee a more favorable level of protection? And a follow-up question, um, as for those such as Portugal that have not notified derogations during the state of emergency in case of complaints, I guess that there will be convictions both by disrespecting Article 15 and the unduly derogated rights, um, such as rights to freedom of movement. Perhaps the court has to make strategies to make joint decisions, for example, or otherwise it will be loaded with many complaints all about the same rights that were unduly restricted. So this, I believe, within the context of um, COVID-19. And I will uh, read the last question for, for Judge Ana Guerra Martins from Marina Goulart de Queiroz. She says, um, considering the pilot judgments, it could be considered as an activist position of the ECHR or in a perspective of evolutionary interpretation. So I hope this was clear. Otherwise, I can reread some of them. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear to all the, the, the participa participants. I, I have to say that uh, this is very interesting, um, all these different perspectives. Uh, Dr. Teixeira da Mota, I, I have to, to I, I agree with you in some, to some extent. Although I was, I think the judge rapporteur <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the constitutional part of the, the case uh, public, wasn't I? I'm not sure. I remember in the case of uh, public, I think there was a, a vote against the decision from the judge Lucia Meral. Yes. I was, was that, was I was that one? Rapporteur. I was the rapporteur, so... so... So you are a friendly enemy too. I am a friendly enemy, but in, in a different sense, because uh, the problem was not that I, I wouldn't have, uh, for me, to, it would have been a pleasure to, 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 
to, to, to deal with the merits of this case, I have to say that I almost cry when I didn't uh, I didn't have the majority to 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 do uh, the merits, but the, the, it was in our uh, case law well, impossible to to. Yes. So uh, sometimes uh, judges are not so free as lawyers. Sometimes judges are not so so free as lawyers, and sometimes it's the the opposite. So we have. <laughs> And uh, I also agree with uh, with uh, a lot of things that um, that our um, our um, agent uh, Mrs. Uh, Fat Dr. Fatima Carvalho said. Um, for instance, concerning the impact strategy, but I have to say that. Um, the impact strategy is something that you are implementing now, but it, it will be uh, reassessed uh, in the next year and in the next two years. The problem of, of this card is that we have a backlog very uh, huge and it is, it is uh, difficult to, to deal with all these, these cases. And uh, we try, uh, and the pro proceedings uh, start before I came here, uh, we try to um, give the most we can do, uh, give the most we can give with the resources that we have, that are not many, that are not so many as we need. As far as in one year, I'm here uh, for only one year, but as far as I can understand. So concerning the questions, um, concerning the questions, I, I'd like to say to Alessia uh, that I can't answer your questions because this, um, in my capacity of judge of the European Court of Human Rights, I can't, uh, make considerations about the capability of the, the Court of Justice of the European Union um, to protect human rights in, in the European Union. Uh, but I can say that you can read an article that I wrote in uh, 2060, uh, I think, uh, and this article is, is uh, publicized in my page of um, ResearchGate and the Academia Du and all these things about the, the opinion 2013 and the multi-level uh, constitutionalism and the multi-level protection of human rights. And if you read this article, it's, I'm not speaking now, it's what I said in this article, um, I criticized uh, uh, a lot, and, and this I cannot delete because this is publicized. I criticized a lot this opinion in the perspective of the protection of the multi-level protection of human rights. So, uh, if you are curious, you can read it and you can understand what is my 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 uh, thoughts about this. Concerning the um, questions of uh, Ana Rita Gil, uh, hello. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to see you, even if it is uh, by Zoom. Um, the, the question of the relations, uh, it's very difficult to anticipate what is what is uh, going on, what is uh, what is the future uh, in these cases, and it is very difficult to anticipate if the uh, member states who, who, who didn't uh, communicate the derogation um, will have more or less uh, proceedings than the others. Uh, because uh, uh, our court has a um, huge uh, case law uh, concerning crisis, uh, 
uh, without the uh, application of Article 15. So, um, the convention has the, the tools to uh, respond to, to, to crisis and the, um, the economic and financial crisis was an example, but not a good one in my perspective, but the terrorism crisis and the crisis of refugees and, and um, migrants, uh, this is, uh, they are uh, many, many um, cases where we can see that it is not necessary to um, invoke Article 15 um, and the court accept the, the restrictions of human rights in some cases, it, especially in terrorism cases. Uh, and there are states who invoke, which invoke the Article, Article 15 and there are others that not. I see my friend and colleague, Anya, I don't know if you would like to make a speech now. If you'd like, I, I, would, I would give you my time. First of all, thank you very much, uh, my dear colleague. Uh, I apologize for coming in so late. I just returned from our deliberations, which were long today. Uh, we had a very intensive uh, agenda, so I, I would like just to take the opportunity to greet you all and to apologize for my late coming. I'm afraid that uh, have not having been able to, to attend this meeting beforehand, I'm not sure whether I can contribute uh, too much. Uh, if I understand correctly, um, Anna Maria was just referring to um, Article 14 in the, in, the, in the health crisis, and I couldn't agree more that um, uh, the, the practice of most of the um, of the Council of Europe states, especially the, the, the Western countries, have opted not to seize the opportunity to declare any kind of emergency um, on, based on the understanding that the convention itself gives some room for, um, especially in terms of uh, the freedom of assembly to deal with these uh, cases uh, as a matter of uh, justification and also I think that um, the underlying tone was also to prevent that this would set a bad precedent uh, if, if there was a state of, of emergency being declared in the COVID crisis. Uh, so uh, what I, we have seen over the past uh, year is that even those states who reacted very swiftly in declaring this state have by and large then taking it back and have uh, hex, have uh, adjusted to the, the common procedures as uh, used by the, by the other countries. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, the other question was uh, if the pilot judgments are uh, uh, a manifestation of uh, activist care. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, I don't like at all this, this uh, expression, uh, ac judiciary uh, activism, uh, because I think that all courts are activists. That means, uh, a, uh, it depends on, on, on what we, uh, we talk, uh, on, uh, on what we think that is activism, but that the activism for me, it's the, it's the interpretation of the, the, the law uh, and of the, the principles uh, and of the rules. And every court must interpret the rules. The rules are not uh, completely clear, are not completely... We are very far away from the uh, in clarion no, of it interpretatio. So, um, the pilot judgments are, are more than uh, activism. The pilot judgments uh, are uh, one way that the card found to um, avoid thousands of cases uh, for the same subject and for the same problem. It's, it's a way to, uh, of course, this is more constitutional than, than uh, individual justice, 
but this is a way to to persuade the states to um, uh, at the end of the day to um, to implement the law in conformity of the convention and the, the favorable uh, the more favorable uh, level of protection um, and the margin of appreciation uh, i don't i, I don't uh, i don't know if uh, th there are contradictory uh, contradictory um, concepts because um, and another another appearance is uh, the margin of, of appreciation the, the curve is not uh, so um, the margin uh, in certain in certain uh, in certain cases the curve doesn't give the, the margin of appreciation of the, the states in a way uh, very very wide uh, the question is that uh, what I said and what I, 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 I really believe on, it's that if you have a multi-level uh, uh, system of protection of human rights, you have to achieve a better and more protected uh, system than if you have no, not uh, multi-level protection. The question is why have a multi-level system if at the end of the day, uh, the protection is, is, uh, is not uh, better than at the beginning. So uh, what uh, I, I truly believe it's that with this multi-level protection, uh, due to the interactions between all the cards, it's possible. It's possible. It's, it is not. It is not. Uh, um, it cannot be in one case or in two cases. Or it, but in general, in uh, when we uh, make the, the full accountability, <laughs> when we make the full. Um, uh, balance it's better to to uh, the protection must be better so uh, than before this this was uh, my idea i've already uh, written about this and uh, but it's it, it's dif difficult now to to elaborate on these issues because i am judge so i have to be cautious in some some uh, issues Thank you very much. Uh, I uh, 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 have to say that I am very, very happy with this, with this, uh, this, uh, and very proud of my my faculty and of the observatory. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers, and I I am always available for you if you organize more things. Uh, count on me and uh, we can do interesting things and my colleague Anya is going to speak in the next uh, in the next conference <laughs> because she she was uh, very enthusiastic when I, I told her about this event she was very enthusiastic but at the end of the day the meeting was of course, uh, most important than uh, this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I already, uh, I already saluted Judge Anya Seibert for for joining us uh, anyway. So thank you for participating, uh, even if you were in uh, deliberations uh, before. Uh, we will certainly count on you for a next webinar. Uh, be sure to be troubled uh, in uh, <laughs> in uh, the next few months or uh, something in order to uh, to participate in another webinar. Uh, perhaps now we could have the, the the questions for Judge Jean Miguel because I know he has to leave in about four or five minutes. So perhaps we could speed it up a bit. Yes, um, so the questions for 
Uh, Dr. João Miguel, we're from uh, Bianca Cartagenas and from Ana Rita Gil. Uh, Bianca asked um, how he suggests that uh, it is possible to assess the state's margins of appreciation in the execution of pilot judgments. And Ana Rita Gil asks, uh, well, she also compliments and, and thanks him for the, the presentation. and. Um, asks, as a judge, I would like to know your perspective on pilot judgments. Do you think they go beyond the judicial functi function and are more of a political tool? So these are the two questions for Dr. João Miguel. Thank you so much, uh, Beatriz. Uh, let me to, uh, salute uh, Judge and Judge Four for joining us uh, this moment and uh, to, to have uh, the opportunity to, 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 to say uh, some words to the, to the audience. Uh, before answering to the, to the, um, the questions uh, put by Anrita and by Bianca, let me say that uh, Teixeira de Motor raised one issue that is for me very interesting, and indeed I had already thought about it, which is in those cases where there are jurisprudence of the court that in a, in a moment, in a given moment, can be in a such a way uh, incompatible with the provisions of constitutional, um, uh, with constitutional provisions, which is uh, in the sense that we have mentioned already, and, and then the, the margin of appreciation of states are at stake. Uh, if, uh, um, according to the, the jurisprudence, or at least uh, to the, the doctrine, uh, our um, the, the fundamental rights, they do, they have to make uh, we have to make them comfortable. We cannot uh, uh, deny one and favor another one. We have to, we have to make uh, comfortable them. And uh, regarding the uh, freedom of expression and Article 10, sometimes uh, the, the, the margin of appreciation of states is very narrow. When we are dealing with the, the political issues and the, the, the political um, uh, speech, which is different when we are talking about the, 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 the defamation or, the, or whether, uh, let's say, um, crimes between uh, civilians, but with not the public interest. So there is there a moment where uh, it can be uh, an interesting uh, dialogue between the court and the, the constitutional court and the European court on that, on that, uh, on that issue. So uh, regarding the two questions, I, um, on pilot judgments, uh, indeed I had um, some, um, I was at that moment in 2004 uh, when the, the first pilot judgment was rendered. I was the, the agent of the government before uh, the court. And it, is, uh, um, it was rather strange, but then uh, I realized and we realized that it was a tool, a very important tool that state, that the court had to solve those thousands and thousands of applications that were uh, at the um, uh, at the court, uh, the case, the Borniowski case, it was a good example of it. It was more than uh, 20,000 applicants, as far as I remember, on it. And uh, uh, the court could give uh, the, um, a decision or a judgment on those situations that were clear and could be solved uh, uh, with the, 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 the elements that, that the court had. I do not see, I must say, uh, usually these situations are, uh, 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 have a link with some political um, and sensitive issues. But in this, uh, in this part, and not only this, um, this, uh, this case, uh, the Torinovsk or even uh, Utrecht Shapka, or even others, uh, I think that is a tool, a tool that can be used and has been used by the court and is uh, uh, included in the, the, the um, which seen less uh, like a juridical and, um, and not political uh, and not political uh, instrument. For this, I, I believe that the, 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 
it can be uh, 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 an important tool and that's been from to the court to solve and to um, and to, to 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 give answers for uh, those specific and sens sometimes sensible to, uh, sensible uh, case for uh, the the margin of appreciation and executions of the judgments um, uh, I, I i must say that uh, the execution of uh, these uh, judgments once uh, once rendered by the court uh, they go to the committee of ministers and then there is a dialogue uh, between the, the judgment, the, 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 the committee of ministers and the state uh, to comply with the the judgment. If uh, in a, a given moment the state uh, do not comply or does not comply with, uh, with the, the, the judgment, still it can be asked to the court uh, uh, which uh, ways can be uh, um, uh, can be followed? So um, the, the the let's say the the, the the margin of appreciation in this sense, as far as I see, can be seen in this dialogue between the 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 the, 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 the committee of ministers, which indeed it's not the judicial body, but indeed is the one that the court. Uh, uh, gave the, the power to uh, monitor and to execute the, the judgments and the, the, the government and the, the government the states contracting states. I think I have answered to the to both questions. If you feel that need some more explication uh, explanation, please, I'm, I'm feel free that I'm ready to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, I think we still have uh, time for a, uh, a last set of, um, of questions. Maybe we can join again two or three together for a, for a last uh, round. I don't know uh, to whom are the questions uh, directed to. We have one, one last question. Okay. Um, <laughs> unless there are... Uh... Anyone would like to make questions uh, now? Uh, we have a question from, from Vlad uh, to, to all of the speakers on their opinion on the possibility and the necessity of future ratification of the Protocol 16 to the Convention by Portugal. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually very to the point. <laughs> yes. let's, uh, let's have, a, a, let's have a, a round on this and then we can, uh, uh, we can close. So please. <clears throat> if you allow me, may I uh, give uh, the answer in first place because I have to leave? Please. please thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, I must say that I was a little bit surprised when uh, this uh, protocol was, um, was adopted. Indeed, uh, um, I followed the, 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 for a long time the, the works of the um, Steering Committee on Human Rights. Um, this topic was already uh, on the table, discussions and the huge discussions, sometimes long discussions, some uh, of the um, uh, states uh, or some of the, the experts in favor, some others not in favor. The majority was not in favor because it was said that uh, not it was not seen as an important um, and uh, effective uh, tool for uh, for the court and for the state because states were not binding uh, for using the conclusions and the, the given by the, the court. Really, I I, I had. Um, some time ago, I went uh, through the, the, um, the website of the European Court and uh, realized that some one dozen, uh, um, roughly 10 or 15 uh, uh, opinions have already been uh, asked. Uh, I assume that they are perhaps important for those cases, for those uh, countries, but at that moment when I was there, I didn't um, see a very particular added value for those, um, for those, for that, uh, that tool. 
but indeed now it's it's uh, it's already adopted if uh, uh, the country will adopt will uh, ratify or not the the the, the, the protocol is something that is it's more uh, is more uh, um, uh, is rather a, a, a political decision than a technical one and uh, the, i must say i'm still not convinced that is a very important tool but indeed we already have it and now the decision is only for the for the for the state if they want to uh, ratify or not to ratify and be um, and uh, be uh, I can the word is um, and uh, be member of the, the of the protocol. Thank you so much. Good. Someone else wants to uh, answer Vlada's question about Protocol 16 or some considerations about that. I can. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I have many things to say, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we know. <laughs> we know <laughs> you can speak a lot about this matter. <laughs> well, uh, if there are no, uh, well, I can I can say just a small oh, contribution about that. I, I didn't take much, uh, didn't pay much attention to the, this uh, protocol sixteen. I think it's interesting as a general idea, but I didn't study implications. And uh, hearing my friend uh, João. Uh, I have more doubts than I had before. But uh, uh, there's one thing that is interesting. In one of the cases of the Supreme Court, where they quoted the Supreme Court, the European Court decisions, and that uh, they accepted the, the reasoning about the Article 10, uh, there is a sentence where uh, they say, well, we don't have the same mechanism that happens to be with the European Court of Justice. We don't have the uh, uh, renvoi préjudiciel. Uh, so uh, the Supreme Court judges in Portugal were asking for Article for Protocol 16 even before it was sought uh, in the European Court. You see, it was some years ago. They, they, they wrote, we don't have it, so we can't do it, so we have to decide by ourselves. It's just an interesting information. That's all. Very rare, very rare. So it's rather different the content. Yes. That's well, all. I, I would like to add something about this um, just uh, very shortly, considering the Portuguese uh, reality. It would be very interesting uh, if uh, acceding to Protocol 16, uh, not only the, uh, the Supreme Court or both of our Supreme Courts, because we have two right, the Supreme Court of Justice and the Supreme Administrative Court, but also the constitutional courts would have access uh, or could use uh, Protocol 16. This actually creates a very interesting um, crossroad because if the constitutional court would be allowed to use uh, this tool, this would uh, unequivocally place the constitutional court under the European Court of Human Rights in a certain sense. Uh, which, which would be very interesting. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the Portuguese state would leave the constitutional court out of the pool of Supreme Courts that could use the uh, Protocol 16 mechanism, uh, this, this would create other difficulties, like uh, questions like, well, then what's the use or what's the role of the European Convention of, of Human Rights when it comes to rule on constitutionality. Uh, is the court, is the constitutional court forbidden to use it uh, or uh, should it use it in some other ways just for interpretation or what? Uh, and uh, I think that also if, the, uh, if Portugal would leave the constitutional courts out of this pool, it would bring back uh, all discussions like uh, uh, the situation, the, the parallel or non-parallel situation of the constitutional court vis-a-vis -vis the Supreme Courts. Uh, so I, I see many implications. Uh, I say I see many implications uh, uh, on this topic, which obviously we can't solve here. 
So, uh, of course, many of these issues uh, were already in our minds, but I guess that uh, this webinar today was very fruitful um, in what comes to collecting uh, potential future topics for other webinars. Uh, I have listed uh, a few, adding to the number that we already had. <laughs> so, um, be sure uh, to come back. Uh, we intend to keep the, the dynamic of this observatory um, with some webinars a year. Uh, it's, uh, to be completely honest, uh, it's not yet clear uh, how, uh, how, will, uh, how will we uh, do this if we will space this two, three, four months, it's still a bit unclear. Uh, I mean, we have ideas on this, but it's still a bit unclear. But anyway, we will advertise it. And of course, we will have other initiatives and we will be uh, very happy to invite all of you again to participate and to uh, and to listen and to place your questions and doubts. And this is the, the role of the observatory, to raise issues and to promote uh, discussion. Whether we get any answers or not, well, that depends on lots of things. <laughs> so again, thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, and uh, please uh, be... Uh, uh, be attentive to our uh, to our next uh, initiatives thank you all thank you